On April 17, 1942, in one of the gloomy halls of the Sofia military court, after a long and agonizing interrogation of the accused, the chairman of the court announced the verdict of four young men accused of communist activities. Two years, six and ten years in prison, compared to life imprisonment or the death penalty, to which this grey-haired guardian of law and authority generously sentenced as retribution for those who had the courage and daring to fight for the freedom of their people, meant too little to him and did not concern him at all. All he cared about was getting an extra star on his shoulder, a reward for his tireless labour. The four accused were silent. On the far right stood Sasho Bolshoi, a tall, pale carpenter. Next to him stood a blonde-haired 18-year-old foundry worker, also Sasho, with delicate girlish features. And between them and me stood Vera Yakimova, an energetic black-eyed girl. We looked proudly at the judges and tried to show with our gaze that we would not give up. Behind us stood our anxious relatives and witnesses, who were eager to hear whether the court would grant the prosecutor's demand or not. The bald prosecutor in the rank of Major, whose bulging eyes emphasised his snake-like malice even more, attributed to us exploits that made us look like party leaders. Everyone expected the prosecutor to drop his demand after the conclusion of the trial and the examination of witnesses, but to everyone's amazement he did not. I insist on the death penalty, he said haughtily. Now it was the turn of the chairman. He stood erect at his full height behind an oblong table covered with heavy green plush. In the face of a fair themis, the chairman pronounced the sentence. He read my verdict last. You have been acquitted, he said, and a faintly sly grin slid across his thin lips. But do not think that you have already received a medal for innocence. From these words and the threatening glances of the police agents present in the room, I realised that the fascist authorities were anxious to get me back behind bars as soon as possible, and now I was eagerly awaiting the moment when I would finally escape from their filthy hands. As soon as the chairman's voice was silenced, three resolute voices sounded loudly in the hall, one after the other. I plead not guilty. I consider the trial unfair. It was the defendants who said their last word. There was a murmur of approval. There was weeping. The judges hastily put down the voluminous volumes of law and the folders with the indictment materials and almost ran out of the room. The convicts were allowed to see their loved ones, and I was sent back to prison. What joy! What marvellous thoughts take possession of a person when he finds himself at the threshold of freedom. You are handcuffed, locked in a stinking cell, deprived of visits from your family, deprived of the right to sing and rejoice, suffering the abuse of the most vile scum and suddenly everything changes. You find yourself on the other side of the high prison wall. You meet your comrades who lived days and nights under the threat of arrest. You embrace them and swear that you will never fall into the clutches of the enemy. And this desire to meet your comrades is even stronger if you have held up well in the face of the class enemy and the organization has remained undiscovered and continues the struggle. Leaving the military courtroom in which hundreds and thousands of cruel sentences were passed, I was in a hurry, in a hurry like never before. I was even ready to fly, but my heavy police escort, wiping his forehead, shouted now and then, Don't hurry, boy. We'll make it. There's enough time. If I were in such a hurry, there would be nothing left of me. If you knew how much I hate your prison, you wouldn't say a word. It's no big deal. A prison is just a prison. People live there too, said the policeman calmly. A prison is like a prison. It would be better if these people went home to their relatives. What should we do then? He frowned. You want us fired, don't you? It was clear that we couldn't find common ground, so I shut up. From street to street, corner to corner, we were in front of the prison. Five metre walls, surrounded by barbed wire on top, with pointed towers on the corners, from where the frozen sentries were watching, causing people both fear and sympathy at the same time. More than one patriot was tortured behind these steps, and how many more will have to experience all the horrors of being in this stone bag? We can only learn about it from the incoming registers, which the prison administration keeps in the most careful way. It is not without reason that many people made attempts to escape from here, digging deep underground passages with their fingernails day and night, for a number of years and carrying earth in their pockets. The thirst for freedom took precedence over the fear of retribution and the crippling round-the-clock labour. The policeman pressed a white button, visible from afar on the red iron gate, and immediately a heavy bolt rattled inside. 
A small gate opened, and the figure of the police warden appeared before us. He stood with his legs wide apart. After exchanging notes with my escort, he signaled to me to go on. I went, but as I had to be almost motionless for over a month, I could feel my legs weakening as I climbed the stone steps of the spiral staircase. Just a little longer, I encouraged myself, and gathering my last strength, I climbed to the topmost floor. In the cell I found only three gymnasium students, Neo Vaterhof, Nikola Gostev, and Tancho Fingerov, who were involved in the conspiratorial organization recently uncovered in the Koprivstitsa gymnasium. The investigation of their case was over and they were now awaiting trial. Two of them differed little from each other, did not stand out in any special way, and left no noticeable trace in my memory. I was much more impressed by Nino. He was characterized by unusual cheerfulness, always invented all sorts of witty stories, from morning to night keeping his comrades cheerful mood, whether because of his transitional age or because of some damage to his vocal cords, he was always siren, and this in itself caused involuntary laughter. Nino became especially comical when he tried to recite. His neck veins would swell from the strain, his eyes would become bloodshot, and drops of sweat would appear on his swarthy face, which he would wipe away not with a handkerchief for want of one, but with the cuff of the sleeve of his threadbare jacket. Nino was a laughing stock, too, with his bobbed hairdo to which he devoted much time and attention. His hair was stiff and stood out like stubble, and he wanted it to lie back smoothly. He would even dissolve sugar in a saucer and wet it, and he would not let his comb and mirror out of his hands all day long. Among the inhabitants of our cell, Nino was the most ardent admirer of poetry. He could listen for hours to poems by Botev, Smirnensky, and other poets. When I entered the cell, Nino jumped up from his bunk, and his mischievous eyes, immediately reading the joyful news on my face, lit up and danced. In them I saw joy and fighting spirit and hope. So it was a good thing your goat broke loose and ran away, said Nino ironically. It was he who had heard me tell my so in the morning before I left for court, and now related it to reality. Good, great, Nino went on, hopping on one foot and the other. Now I'll scribble a letter to my uncle, and if I'm lucky, I'll soon be able to throw up my old student cap too. Having encouraged his companions to take up their letters, Nino seized a sheet of paper and a pencil, sat down on his bunk, drew up a box of provisions, laid it on his knees, and began stringing small letters like beads. But not one, but many more letters had to be written to these boys before they were released. Soon the other condemned comrades returned to the cell. They were namesakes, both of them were called Sasho, and in order not to confuse them, we called one of them Sasho Big and the other Sasho Little. They came in unhappy. Sasho Small, although he had received a lighter sentence, was especially gloomy. Six years and eight months imprisonment, not a small amount. From now on the whole bright multifaceted world was limited for him to four dirty walls and a piece of sky in the window and how many times during this time he could get into a cramped like a matchbox, and damp, like a cellar, the punishment cell where he would have to watch by the light of a dim electric bulb as slowly sliding down the cement wall drops of water, as mould blooming corners, and stoically endure the cold, penetrating almost to the bones. He would bear it all because he was a member of the Union of Working Youth, but it was impossible not to sympathise with him. In prison they took every opportunity to deliver the news, I felt obliged to deliver the letters of my comrades and suggested that both Sasho and I write a few lines. Hey, friends, Nino suddenly addressed them, don't despair. It's not the worst. There are worse. They didn't take your head off your shoulders. Go about your business. Write that everything is fine, that you have enough food, and no hint of despair. Do not think that you will have to serve the whole term. Nothing like that will happen. The Red Army will liberate us. That's so, said Sasho Big but you'll have to sit there till then. The situation is not so favourable yet. The border population, subjected to forced Serbianization, suffered a lot of grief from the Serbian fascists. People crossed the border illegally and sought refuge with their relatives in Bulgaria. The memories of refugees who abandoned all their possessions only to find freedom do not fade easily, but instead of freedom they had to endure the cruel exploitation of the Bulgarian rich even here. But even the present border did not correctly solve the question of national self-determination of the population. It has further contributed to the enmity between the peoples of Bulgaria and Yugoslavia. The inhabitants of Trani had a long fighting tradition, 
beginning with the Chipreview Prizing, and then in the time of the uprising in Zinpel, known as Biglishki Juba, the Russo-Turkish War of 1828, 1829 and the ensuing popular movement Trinsky Revolt, the major uprising of Moravian Bulgarians in 1840. 1841, led by Metropolitan Gra a native of Trina Okolia, the Serbian-Turkish War of 1862 and the uprising in Zimipol, which was being prepared at that time. The Trina population always showed great revolutionary activity after the liberation from the Turkish yoke. This activity was maintained for several generations, and the glorious fighting traditions were kept as a sacred covenant among the people. In 1903, 1923 many Trincans, working in the mines of Pernik, had the opportunity to become closely acquainted with some of the leaders of the Bulgarian socialist movement. Temelko Nenkov and Georgi Dimitrov were the organizers of many strikes for the improvement of the miner situation, and in these strikes the coal miners received such a hardening that even the defeat of the September 1923 uprising did not make the Trincans give up socialist ideas. Anticipating the decline of the uprising, members of the Communist Party organized several illegal channels and transported dozens of revolutionaries in danger of death to Yugoslavia. During this period, communists of unprecedented hardiness grew up who could not be broken even by the most brutal police repression. The names of Georgi Popisajev, a folk teacher from the village of Kosturinci, and Blago Stratiev, a young peasant boy from Slevsovsi, who died in terrible agony but did not betray the organization, are remembered here to this day as synonymous with firmness. The party took deep roots among the workers of Trinsko Okuli. They participated with equal fervor in the expulsion from the villages of the Sankovist gangs that were terrorizing the population and in the barricade fights in the city organized by the party in defense of the interests of the workers and the people as a whole. In 1931, 1934, when the country was ruled by a block of reactionary parties, when the paid agents of the bourgeoisie shot with impunity the party figures, the communists of TRUNIA, and under their influence the rest of the population of Okoli, expressed their deep disgust and indignation against them in various ways. During all kinds of elections, both when community and district councillors were elected and when deputies to parliament were elected, the inhabitants in their majority always stood for our party. There is no action organized by our party in which the Trenji people did not take part, and the people of Trenje are part of the Bulgarian people, in whose history the immortal names of Levski, Botev, Dimitrov shine. Their heroic glory crossed the borders of Bulgaria, and the name of Dimitrov became the banner of the world proletariat. Now when the party entrusted me with such a serious task, to organize a partisan detachment, the revolutionary past of our people gave me confidence and strength. We came down to the valley quite early. Cattle were still grazing in the meadows, and here and there shepherds glimpsed us. No one was supposed to see us, so we immediately hid in the bushes on the bank of the river Vukanshtaitsa. From there we had a clear view of the whole sheep barn, but not a single person showed up there. Only a big black dog with a white stripe on his neck would occasionally attack the chickens when they dared to approach him, chase them away with a bark, and then crawl back into the kennel, into the shade. We had been sitting in the bushes for quite a long time, and no one had appeared in the yard. We began to worry. Suddenly we would not be able to see Piata at all, and that would almost derail our meeting with the party leadership. We even began to think about new options for organizing a meeting with our comrades, as suddenly Peter appeared in the yard of the Koshara, although it was still quite light and someone could see us. We couldn't resist. We jumped up and whistled. Peter looked around. We whistled again. Peter began to look at the shrubbery, but either he didn't see us or didn't recognize us. Only when we waved our hats at him, he hesitantly came towards us. Hey, hey, people, what are you looking for here? Concerned by our sudden appearance? Peter asked. We are looking for you. We answered, and both of us clasped him in our arms. He at once wanted to take us to his house, but when he found out the purpose of our visit and what our task was, he immediately hid with us in the bushes, where we sat until dark. Peter's father did not expect to see us either. At first he too could not understand what was going on. He thought we were joking, but when we explained to him the essence of the events and the measures taken by the party in connection with them, father and son immediately and eagerly got down to business. Peter went to town to arrange a meeting with his comrade Slavcho Nikolov, 
and his father, Bavasil, organized surveillance of the surrounding countryside so that the enemy would not take us by surprise. From that day on, Bajavasil and his family became the center of our conspiratorial activity. Already on the first evening, we managed to see our comrades Slavcho Nikolov and Tako Simov. Both were tailors. They shared a workshop in the city, but they rarely spent the night there. They returned to their home in the village of Radovo, five kilometers from Tryon. The road to the village passed next to a sheep barn. Slavcho's brother, the teacher Jordan Nikolov, was a member of the Okoli Party Committee, and Slavcho was a technical worker. Both were good, dedicated communists. Slavcho was characterized by his businesslike nature, while Jordan, known for his eloquence throughout the district, favored words, Slavcho took on the most risky and difficult jobs that others shied away from. It was this trait of his that made me seek to meet him in the first place. I had known Jordan since my gymnasium years, and later I met him many times in my work in the organization. He enjoyed the authority of our people, and we gymnasium students considered him one of the most prominent and principled communists. The enemy also evaluated him in the same way, and that is why he was expelled from the city several times. Eventually convinced that these measures could not break him, the fascists deprived Jordan of the opportunity to teach, and he was forced to depend on his wife, who was a teacher in Shipkovis, one of the most remote villages in the Okali. This village, together with the villages of Kaisli, Lower and Upper Melna, Dolga Luka, Luka, Lua Rika, Dokjovci, Vidra and Goroshevsi, was part of the so-called Christ, which was the political base of Jordan Nikolov. He was responsible for this district to the Okali Party Committee. These were the poorest villages in Okolia. People literally tortured the stony soil, driving iron coulters into it with force, and it did not forgive them for this. It forced them to continually pick and scratch themselves, and repaid them for their hard labor with a cap of oats or a basket of small potatoes. And with these oats and potatoes, the peasants not only had to feed themselves, but also to help the state by performing the so-called requisition. It would, of course, have been very good to meet with Jordan as well, but he was out of town. To summon him from Christ Day would have required us to stay here for at least another day, and we were in a hurry, so we decided to meet him on the way back. Slatsho Nikolov was aware of almost all the activities of the committee. He felt that the leadership was not sufficiently connected with the village organizations, did not meet regularly to discuss vital issues, and that there had been some curtailment of its work. In contrast to the Bresnik organization, the cadres of Trezinsky remained almost all in place. Here, the police failed to uncover anything and were content with expelling the secretary of the committee, Comrade Georgi Grigorov. His place was taken by Arso Rashev, one of the oldest communists in Okoli. But Comrade Arso turned out to be passive, and this immediately affected the whole activity of the party organization. And now, when it was so important to find first of all the secretary of the committee, I knew that he would not come to the meeting, justifying himself by saying that he was being followed, that he was being spied on at every step, that all eyes were watching him and all ears were listening to him. With one way or another, he needed to know what was going on in Okolia, and we thought that Slavsho or Jordan Nikolov would inform him. However, I still wanted to try to meet him in person. The vigorous life of the village organizations before the outbreak of the war with the Soviet Union had now completely stalled in a number of villages. This was mainly due to the terror against the communists. The temporary failures of the Red Army at the front and the passivity of the party leadership among the many passive organizations, there were also a few active ones in the Okali. They held regular meetings. Their members reported, followed and discussed political events, raised funds to help the exiled and political prisoners, and in the most difficult days of the struggle, on the Eastern Front, found encouraging words and facts to maintain the belief in victory, not only among themselves, but also among non-party members. The situation was different in the local organizations of the Union of Working Youth. The youth were more organized, they were enthusiastic, and they lit up at every even the most insignificant news of joy from the front. If the work of the Okali Committee becomes more active, our task will be much easier. Relying on the Okolian organization, we will be able to act more courageously, more energetically, not on the feel without risk, but regardless of the state, good or bad, in which the individual organizations were in, the new situation compelled us to change some of the existing forms of work and to seek new ones that would be fully appropriate to the new conditions and the new tasks. It was necessary.
First of all, to place at the head of the individual districts the most active communists who were ready, under all conditions, day and night, to work with the rural party organizations and to control the fulfillment of the tasks assigned to them. This was to be the first step towards revitalization. As I parted from Slavcho and Tarko, I expressed the hope that I would soon have the opportunity to meet with the entire leadership of the organization to discuss and take measures to revitalize the work together. A, they say they refused to give up the requisition and fed some partisans. I don't know what kind of guerrillas. The news about the partisans made me happy. I explained to the woman that these partisans were armed Serbian patriots who were protecting the population from the plunder of the occupying authorities of Germany and Bulgaria. That may be so, she agreed. They are said to hide in the forests and harass headmen, policemen and tax collectors. I don't know much about these things. My husband knows more about them. At this time, an elderly man approached us. He was thin and tall, with rounded cheekbones overhanging his sunken cheeks. His moustache had not been cut for a long time. The ends of it were covered by two deep creases that ran symmetrically downward from his long, pointed nose. His name was Grandpa Napso, and he was a neighbour of our interlocutor, as she introduced him to us. He shook hands with us and in turn began to ask who we were, where we came from and how we came to be at their well. When the old man realised that we were returning from the Turkish border, he sighed and said, And my son is there too. I don't know if we will see each other again before the war with the Turks starts. His mother cried her eyes out. She's crying and crying. People were not unreasonably expecting war with Turkey. Most of our army was on the Turkish border, digging trenches and building fortifications. Tens of mobilised men were sent there. They built deep tunnels out of reinforced concrete, through which special troops dragged heavy guns and installed them in reinforced concrete bunkers. These guns, which the soldiers wrote to their loved ones about, could talk at any moment. Natso's grandfather was very concerned. Who needs war? He asked us and himself. Can't the powers that be work things out amicably? They can, Grandpa Natso. Why shouldn't they be able to? But it is the rich who prevent it, the ones who benefit from the war. That's the way it is, said the old man. But I have fought in several wars and have earned nothing, only ruined my health. This woman's father-in-law and I are both almost invalids. And who do you think will win the war? The Russians or the Germans? I asked not without intent. The Russian man is strong, said Grandpa Nutzo. And the German? The German. His brains are shackled and he is very greedy, answered the old man without hesitation. I wouldn't trade a Russian for a German. And you are teachers, so you have an understanding. Don't speak against Ivan's grandfather. You'll be in trouble. We assured Grandpa Nutso that we would never go against the Russians, and that together with all the people we were fighting against the war and against requisitions. Are you hungry? The old man asked. No, we've just had something to eat. It's all right. A little sour milk will do you good. My grandmother fermented it last night, said Grandpa Nutso, and asking us to wait, hurried down the path. While we were talking to the old man, the woman listened attentively, and when he was far away, she asked, Will you go back to the frontier again? Of course. Do whatever you want, but only if there's no war. Do you hear? Otherwise the people will curse you. She said this and said goodbye, picked up her cauldrons and left. She had to prepare lunch for the threshes. The news she told us was very important, and her reasoning was very correct. Perhaps she will be one of our first helpers. We'll have to visit here again and see her husband. Soon Grandpa Notso returned. He brought a large bowl of sour milk. With him came a little boy, his grandson. He did not let go of his grandfather's hand for a moment and sniffed his snub nose all the time. Do you think, young people, will our rulers dare to oppose Grandfather Ivan? Asked the old man. Everything is possible. Grandpa not so. Our Tsar is a German and Hitler is a German, they will agree. The people will not agree. Hmm, said the old man with conviction. And the Tsar can't fight alone. Who who ask the people that Setar will decide alone? I encourage the old man. They, the Tsar is the people, and they should be asked. It will be bad if they don't ask him, Natso's grandfather argued hotly. He was convinced that it would not be so easy for the Tsar to throw the Bulgarian people and their army against the Soviet Union, and believed that even if the fascists succeeded in doing so, the end would not be so comforting for them. 
Grandfather Natso and I parted like old friends, and he was satisfied with us and we with him. These are the wonderful people we have in our region. These people spoke frankly, expressed what they thought from the bottom of their hearts, and their thoughts helped us to find the right beginning. Grandfather Natso, with his genuine natural wisdom, in a peasant environment, alone was worth as much as several agitators who came from outside. From Glogovitsa to Alexei Zakharyev's Koshara was no more than four kilometers. This distance, in the worst case, we could cover in about an hour, but there was no need for us to show up at Bai Vazil's house before dark. Zakharyev's Koshara was located in the eastern part of the Trien Plain. From there Znepel began. Here the small river Vukapšica flowed into the river Irma, and the highway leading to Kreshta joined the one going to Sadulika, Strizimiropsi, to enter the town with even greater solemnity. Trine was not yet in sight. It was blocked on all sides by high mountains and lurked at the bottom of a deep basin. There are many legends about its origin. According to one of them, the town got its name from a blackthorn bush growing near a spring with cold water, near which several families settled. The number of settlers increased year by year, and soon a large village grew there. Where does the water come from? The answer was a prime. Thus, over time, the name of the shrub became fixed in people's memory, and they began to call their village trine. The fields on the slopes of the mountains separating Hlovhovica from the trine field were as shrunken. Only in some places oats were green against the yellow stubble. When we reached the highest part of the ridge, Mount Rouge appeared before us. Among the shreds of fields we could see white villages, whose names reminded us of the former tortures and sufferings of the inhabitants of Trine. A winding path went down to the field. Not far from us two lonely reapers were singing. Their song was tired and wistful. Do not be afraid, maiden Raider. Do not be afraid of the robbers of the Turks. Your father has, Raider, a pair of grey oxen. He'll give his oxen, Rudder. He won't give you to the Turks. This song transported us to those distant times when our people suffered slavery of dark, ignorant Ottomans, when brigands cured jaily were rampant and only by bribery, it was possible to snatch the victim from the bloody hands of the enslavers. Now the tyrant was different, civilized, but this did not make it easier for the people. The name of the village of Turokivsi, one of the largest villages in the region, which occupies the most fertile part of the valley and reached the slopes of Rui, was a reminder of those times. To the west of Turokivsi, another village, E. Zelenograd, is located under the high rocks. It existed in Roman times as evidenced by the ancient fortress and fragments of bricks, tiles, clay vessels and coins found in the ground, not far from this fortress. Once, according to legend, guarded by a special legion, there was an ancient Roman road that connected the Struma riverbed with the city of Vranja, which is located in present-day Yugoslavia. This route passed through the area called Disip Kladenek and was protected on opposite sides by two fortresses, Zelenigrad and Zeman. The former was on the left and the latter on the right side of the Irma River. Here in this area were the mines where for generations or had been mined and lead, silver and gold smelted for the Roman patricians. Further on, like beads in a necklace around the thick neck of Mount Rui, stretched the villages of Miloslavsai, Havavanopsi, Nesalepsi, Ranilug, Slisopsi, Strezimiropsi, Jipkopsi, Bohova, Stykopsi, Kosturintsi, Vulkan, and Bisipsi. The small valleys occupied by these villages together form Zenpol, an ellipse-shaped plain through which the Irma River flows. It originates near the village of Kostrashopsi, absorbs the mountain streams of Krajani, splits into two parts the town of Trine, passes through a picturesque gorge overgrown with blue and red lilacs, and leaves the Bulgarian territory forming a gorge of fabulous beauty. Near this gorge on May 1, when the police forbade demonstrations in the city, the gymnasium students, under strict guard, organized meetings and decided on actions that would activate the workers of the city and the countryside. From this gorge, the slopes of Ruigora immediately rise. They cover the city from the north, rising in the west up to 1,700 meters above sea level, and are connected by a saddle with the spurs of Bolshaya Rudina. The Yugoslav border runs along the elongated crest of this mountain, cutting in two the farmsteads of several villages in some places, and goes further south to the Mylev Mountains. The second member of the Okoli Committee, Alexander Tinkov, or Bai Sando, was not only more literate, but also more theoretically savvy than Bai Lazo and Bai Krum. His weakness, however, 
was that he preferred theory to practice and was more wary of the police than he should have been. Perhaps that was why he did not come to our first meeting. He was a large man, but the concentration camp had dried him up. His cheekbones came forward sharply, his cheeks sunk deep. Now he had to take up farming again because he had no other choice. By Sando's only source of livelihood was the two cows on which his family focused all their attention. The third member of the committee was Bay Lazo, a hereditary farmer who cultivated not only the land bequeathed to him by his father, but also that which his brothers had abandoned. That's why Bay Lazo felt independent. As long as I work, I will not starve, he declared. And if I don't work, I won't eat. I don't expect service and I don't need it. Thanks to this conviction, he was much bolder and more active than by Crum and by Sando, although they too saw and expected nothing good from the government. The other two members of the Oakley Committee, Ivan Stoinov, the head of the youth organization, and Tador Madanov, a technical worker of the committee and responsible for a group of villages in the Krasava municipality, were not invited. I thought that three comrades would be enough for the first time, and I would have to find Maradinov, this active and authoritative guy, soon. I explained to both members of the committee in detail the new tasks of the party. I explained to them the program of the Fatherland Front as a broad basis for uniting all anti-fascists, and supplied them with the latest party materials. The assurances of comrades Krum Savov and Lazar Petrov that they would take up the new tasks gave me vigour. But I knew that the new conditions required the members of the leadership to travel to the villages, to organise illegal meetings, to organise open demonstrations, to obtain weapons, to provide shelter and food for those who were in danger of arrest. And this was hardly within their capabilities, although they both silently agreed to all the instructions. The beginning was a good one, and the subsequent work depended on two things, on the activity of the leadership and on the development of foreign political events. The latter had an exceptionally great influence on both the non-party and the party masses, and depending on who was winning the battles on the Eastern Front, the Soviet Union or Germany, people became more active or more subdued. Therefore, when the Soviet troops were retreating, it was very difficult to conduct organizational work. From Bresnik, we moved overnight to Trinska Okolia. Our first concern here was to contact the party leadership, but it was risky to go straight to the city. First of all, we had to find a person in the neighborhood who would organize a meeting for us. We considered such a person to be Peter Vasilev, a grammar school pupil whose parents cultivated Alexei Zakharyev's land and lived in his kashar, not far from the town. Ayata studied in the last grade and was a member of the leadership of the local organization of the Union of Working Youth. Not long ago, the organization failed and he fell into the hands of the police. Pietor came out of there severely beaten. His father, Bay Basil, a former Pernik miner, had long ago risen under the banner of the Workers' Party and had never let go of that banner. All his children stood beside him. Poverty, which he could not overcome, did not bend by Basil, and he was always in the forefront of the proletarian fighters. The Koshara, where his numerous family of ten lived, witnessed many party and youth meetings. They were held under the reliable protection of Bai Basil or his son Pyotr. I was sure that Bai Basil's house was always open for us, so we headed straight to it. Not reaching the Koshara, we, exhausted with fatigue, turned to the outskirts of the Maholsil of Glogovitsa. The sun had long since risen, and slowly drifting across the steep blue sky, was burning mercilessly. Work was going on all around. The threshing was in full swing, and people didn't even seem to notice the heat. But oh go, Presda, but oh go, Vrancho, came from the nearer currents. But oh, ran out a high female voice somewhere. The peasants of Glogoix were threshing with their horses. They knew neither reapers nor threshing machines, just as their fields knew neither tractors nor other machines. Everything here was the same as it was a hundred years ago. The peasants did not live, but were tormented and in this torment their miserable, joyless life passed day by day. We found a well. It was deep. The glistening circle of water at its bottom was barely distinguishable in the gloomy shadow of the stone walls. Above it old plum trees bent their branches submissively, their trunks gaping with deep wounds hollowed out by woodpeckers and growing tufts of grey-green moss like goat beards. We threw off our backpacks, which contained a pair of underwear and some food, washed our faces and sat down on the grass. Butterflies circled near us, young nightingales tried their still fragile voices. Bees buzzed monotonously, a light breeze gently stroked our faces, 
and we felt so good, so cheerful. From here we could see the whole Mahala be blue white houses, most of which from the side of the valley seemed to be too storied, but in fact the lower part of them was a cellar, hollowed out deep in the rock and enclosed by massive stone walls. There was a narrow path leading from the village to the well. Suddenly we noticed that a plump, white-faced woman with wily eyes was hurriedly approaching us. The sleeves of her burned-out chintz dress were rolled up to the elbows, and in her muscular hands she held two copper cauldrons. Setting them on the ground, she stared at us, seeming to demand that we explain who we were and how we had come to be here. As we were silent, she said hello, glanced at us once more from head to toe, unhooked a heavy wooden tub, lowered it into the well, and the stiff rope began to uncoil rapidly from the shaft into the depths. But the tub splashed in the water and the shaft stopped spinning. The peasant woman twisted the rope, filled the tub and turned the handle vigorously. The red stains on her cheeks showed that it was not easy to drag the tub full of water. She replied to our kind offer to help. It's all right, I can manage on my own. It has been fifteen years since I entered this house and I don't remember anyone else bringing water but me. Everyone here knows it's my business. Are you from here or from another village? Slavsho asked the woman. I am from here. I was kidnapped answered the woman laughing and told us in detail the story of her marriage. In response to her frankness, she probably expected a frank story from us as well. It was purely female curiosity. But why don't we have a chat with her? Perhaps this casual acquaintance will prove useful to us. Our work requires people, lots of people. The woman told us that she has three children, two girls and a boy. Her husband works in the city, and she and the children live here with her father-in-law and mother-in-law. They live well, she is a hard worker, she respects the old people, and they answer her in the same way. Where are you from? The woman asked in turn. Hmm, very crochet, we are the substitutes. It was a pre-prepared answer, and then we explained that we were teachers and after a long and painful service in the army we were returning to our families. Who knows how much longer the woman would have tormented us with her curiosity if I had not turned the conversation to another topic, to which she responded eagerly. I guess we had struck a chatterbox we could talk to all day long. Harvest? she exclaimed excitedly, weeping our harvest. At work we kill ourselves, and what good is it? Look, and she showed her ragged sleeves, I look like a gypsy. My husband bends his back for thirty lever and feeds seven mouths on this pit, and he's sickly himself. He can barely drag his feet. What does he do? Hey, he's a tailor. He dresses people, but he's a ragamuffin worse than a gypsy. That's the fate we've been dealt. Worse than a dog's. Why don't you ask the authorities to help you? Slavcho remarked on purpose. My God, the woman exclaimed. Have you fallen out of the sky? Who cares how we live? Didn't the authorities take everything from us? Butter, milk and wool? And now it's time for the grain. The headman and the police are waiting for it right at the currents. They're standing over your head to make sure you don't conceal anything. Why do you give it to them? You work hard, don't you? You need it yourself, don't you? I decided to test the woman's political maturity. Would we dare not give? Would we dare not give? Immediately you will be declared a communist, and then hold on. A few days ago they expelled a whole Serbian village here, people and livestock. What was it? The woman was silent. Her inner gaze focused on the picture she saw, sharing the bitter agony of these innocent people, and, clutching her head, she continued. Women are screaming, children are crying, old men are wading barefoot on the hot stones, piglets are squealing in the wagons, and starving sheep, pigs and cows are weaving behind in clouds of dust. They say the whole village has been burned. Mm, police. They say the police. What have these people done? The tasks set by the Fatherland Front were difficult, but feasible. They required full mobilization of the forces of the working class, peasants, intellectuals and the army. I was both cheerful and anxious. What would come out of this first campaign of ours? What could happen? Would the people we were going to trust us? Or would they consider us boys, fantasists and send us away, where we would eat and spend the night? This did not bother us much. It was summer and we could sleep in the open air, and our relatives would not leave us without food. It was good that we set out at night. During the day, the soldiers from the camp near the village of Malobuccino would have noticed us and would have rushed after us. 
Demo, Basil Petrov's younger brother, who undertook to accompany us to a certain place, knew the most inconspicuous ravines on the way to Bresnik and led us confidently. When we had already passed the sparse forest of Yoyin, it began to lighten. The sun came from behind the opposite mountain and, breaking through the small clouds that hid it, began to rise quickly. The chill of the night was fading and the heat of the day was taking its place. Birds chirped and leaves rustled. Nearby came the clatter of an axe. A young peasant was chopping a half-rotten beech tree trunk, but as soon as he noticed us, he grabbed his jacket and ran toward the ravine. He mistook us for foresters, said Demo. Now he can't catch up with us. And it's very good that he ran away. Good for us and good for him. The peasant's escape made us laugh, but the guy wouldn't have been so quick if Demo hadn't yelled after him. Stop, I'll shoot. The woodcutter fell, tumbled over his head, and emitting a strange screech, rolled down through the old beech woods, breaking the rotten limbs beneath him. For several hours more we walked through the woods, crossing dozens of cross ridges and valleys. The sun was beating its scorching rays down on our heads more and more mercilessly. The closer we came to the edge of the forest, the rarer the forest became, and the more difficult it was to bear the heat. The air trembled with heat, and the grass and leaves of the beaches turned yellow and wilted. At last we reached the edge of the forest. A wide panorama opened before us, wheels, villages, fields. We could see the Pernik coal basin, the Golo Birdo range, the road to Bresnik, and the trough-shaped Pernik plain, covered by a transparent veil of whitish smoke, which was continuously emitted by dozens of factory chimneys in the mining town. You can go on your own from here, Demo said, and explain to us how to get to Bresnik and find his brother Laser, an old, experienced communist. Demo wished us success and turned back. Even without knowing the road to Bresnik and the villages it passed by, we did not risk getting lost. The glowing disk of the sun was creeping westward along our route, as if in a hurry to take a cool bath behind the blue mountains on the horizon. From the village of Divertino, attached to the southwestern slope of Yulin, our way lay through the fields. Wheat and barley had long ago been mowed and harvested, and the most skillful owners were already threshing. Only corn was standing in the field. It had long ago been mown and was now ripening under the blazing sun. The peasants who had fallen behind with the harvest were taking the last sheaves from the fields. The grain was spilling out of the parched ears. The protesting squeal of the rusty wheels, which had not known the beneficial tar for God knows how long, was not silent on the dusty lanes. The villages of Raznik, Viskia, Babitsa were left behind. By five o'clock in the afternoon we approached the town of Bresnik and turned to the pine forest on Mount Birdo, which overshadowed the town from the east. It was cool and smelled of resin. There were still few hours before darkness fell, and we had to spend them in the forest. The outer town stretched along a shallow valley and could not spread out. The rocky spurs of the Burido and Greben mountains, which pressed Bresnik from two opposite sides, prevented it. Clouds of dust were rushing over the town, as if trying to overtake each other. Some rose above the currents, and others above the streets where cars and trucks were rushing along. The local authorities did not give themselves the trouble to take care of the cleanliness and beautification of the city. Even its main street looked more like a village street. A layer of dust covered it. For an inch, what to speak of the rest. If the rain did not wash the streets from time to time, people would probably suffocate here from stench and dust. That's why they often held prayer services here. The city fathers appealed to the god, begging him to send them rain or keep away the city building clouds. Their worries did not extend beyond that. Sitting in the pine woods, we had a chance to look over the town. I had happened to pass through it or near it before, but then I looked at it with very different eyes. Now even the most insignificant detail seemed to me to be evaluated from the point of view of the new task before me. Every detail had to be imprinted in a certain corner of my mind, so that as soon as I needed it, I could retrieve it immediately. Several tall buildings with beautiful facades rising in the middle of the city provided the administrative centre. The yellow one was the Okolian office, to the left of it was the tax office, then the land bank building and the engineering office. There were, of course, also barracks. In the northern part of the city was the 5th Cavalry Regiment, whose armories were scattered haphazardly around the gorge. Remember, I remarked to Slavcho, we may have to look for them some night. They are in a good place. It's easy to get there. There are guards there. We need to be careful. Of course, he agreed. 
Everyone's on guard now. As we were absorbed in exploring the city and its surroundings, we didn't notice dusk falling. People were coming home from work, and there was a ruckus. Some shouted at the cattle, others called the children, and young people sang fashionable songs. Lazar Petrov, whom I had called by Lazo before, was the brother of Vasil and Demo. But if Vasil was a large, imposing man, then by Lazo was barely a metre and a half tall. Demo was in the middle, but not short either. And if Vasil chose the profession of a wrestler corresponding to his athletic physique, then by Lazo, with his small stature, veined in Bresnik to measure his strength with the earth. A man who saw him for the first time might have said that this occupation too was beyond him, but as strong as the sun-soaked earth was here, so strong was Bailezo. Bailezo's house could be approached from different parts of the city, but the most convenient way was to go down through the pine forest where we were now. From here the path led directly to his house nestled at the foot of Baido, but how would Bailezo greet us? If we had gone only to see him and leave immediately, there would have been nothing to think about, but we had to spend the night and stay at his house for another day to gather the party leadership and set new tasks for him. But we could have no room for hesitation. As soon as it got dark, we walked along a narrow path winding between young pine trees and soon found ourselves in front of a white one-story house. A dog barked. So much for that. What if the dogs of the whole neighbourhood bark now? I thought. It was good that by Lazo's neighbours were gypsies who didn't even have a cat or a dog otherwise there would have been a terrible ruckus. At the entrance to the house we were met by Bailezo, and behind him his whole family. His wife and five children crowded together. Among them there was only one girl, Zimbulka, too frail and small for her age. The children gave us way, and we followed Aunt Rena, Bailezo's wife, through a narrow corridor and into a room in the western part of the house. It was as small as a matchbox, and was lighted by two tiny windows opposite to which stood two iron beds in parallel. In the middle stood a low round table, on which a kerosene lamp flickered among a pile of old newspapers and scribbled notebooks. You haven't been here for a long time, but you remember our house, said Aunt Rayner, holding little Nestor's hand. What year did I come here, do you remember? The year before last, she answered. The elections were held then. There was a girl with you. I couldn't sleep all night, wondering how you would get there in such a snowstorm. You remember everything, Aunt Rayner? How could I not? Lazo and I voted for our man. God, how much fear I suffered then. Enough to last a lifetime. I kept thinking. People went out in this weather. Who knows what might happen to them? And all I have to do is put down my ballot. And I did, even though those bastards, the agents, were watching our every move. It's their service to watch, said Mr. Lazo, obviously wanting to stop this conversation. They are paid for it. He made a sign to his wife to take the children into another room. Let them listen, let them know, Aunt Rayner objected. They don't need to grow up to be fools. Take them away, Bailezo insisted. They had better have dinner and go to bed now and they will have time to get acquainted with politics. Aunt Rayner submitted. She was the kind of wife who was used to not interfering with her husband and she realised that we had to talk about something the children did not need to know so she took them into the other room. Left alone, we asked Bailezo to tell us about the state of the local organisation. What can I tell you? Answered with a sigh. Terrible. The fascists have gone wild. Arrests, murders, hangings. They hanged black. And what a guy he was, a fire. There aren't many like him now. The secretary of the youth organisation is in prison, and we old people are intimidated. Who's going to feed my kids tomorrow if I go to jail? Sando just got back from a concentration camp and now he's afraid of everything. What can you do? He's a human being. Crumbs under constant surveillance and there's no one to stir up the people. And things are bad, you know. Our men keep losing and losing. It's difficult. By Lazo, terrible. It's clear to everyone. And what's next? Are we going to sit and wait for God to send us something? No. We have work and struggle ahead of us. The fascists are taking these measures against the party to frighten us, to make us bend, and if we bend, it means they have achieved their goal, by any means necessary to prevent it. Oh, by Lazo interrupted me. By active struggle, there are many party members, a whole army, and if this army goes on the offensive, it will be difficult for the fascists to stop it. 
matter will this army go on the offensive when we, the leadership, do not move? Bileso spoke with concern. So we should start from here. The first thing to do is to activate the leadership and then the entire organization. So we will stay here overnight and tomorrow we will gather the other members of the leadership and talk. The next day only Krum Savov came to buy Lazo's house. He was the secretary of the Okolian organization and despite his old age, worked as much as his strength allowed. We had met him several times before and I already had an idea of him both as a leader and as a person. Baikram was a modest and honest communist devoted to the party. But he was a very shy person and he was afraid for his family. He lacked the initiative, energy and perseverance necessary for an organizer and leader on the Okolian scale. If it is true that the character of a man can be judged by his appearance, then Baikram was in this sense a complete match. Slim, sluggish, a little slouching, it seems that his hairdresser's craft did not feed him well, and his salon was shabby. Neither sun nor air penetrated there. Only poor people went to him. However, Bai Crum's craft had its positive sense. People who had to meet always had an excuse. They came for a shave or a haircut. Under this pretext, I also visited his barbershop before I became illegal. Oh, look how strong it is, my scythe, like a razor, remarked the peasant. But it did not obey me. It must have fallen into the wrong hands. He was pleased with my work, and he offered me to mow another meadow for him. I asked him where, and we agreed. The next day I came to him and started mowing with the same passion. Thus, under the name of Mitko, a student from Ferdinando Colli, I mowed not only this peasant's meadow, but also half of his neighbor's meadow. But for some reason the neighbor liked me so much that I had to run away from him, even though I would have had enough work for almost the whole summer. Turns out my new employer had two daughters. Although I gave him no reason, he suddenly began to openly persuade me to go to him as his son-in-law. Then he would start a tavern, and the money would be raked in, and I would finish university. Understandably, I was not at all interested in marriage, and on the pretext that examinations were about to begin, I gave up mowing and went back to Vasil Petrov's house. I had to do something. Inactivity was weighing me down. Just when the party was calling all its sons and daughters to selfless work, I was sitting idle, and this particularly tormented me. Impatiently I waited for the agreed meeting with Yakim. What kind of assignment will it be? Was what worried me and made me even more impatient. Almost a year had passed since Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. The war was in full swing. The Nazis had managed to drive deep wedges into the front line south of Moscow. They hoped to bypass the Soviet capital and cut off the Caucasus from the northern regions. The German army was still on the offensive, and the Soviet troops were retreating. The situation of the Soviet people was becoming more and more difficult day by day. This was widely reflected here in Bulgaria as well. Some sympathized with the Soviet people. Others watched as spectators and refrained from expressing their attitude. And others were clearly on the side of Nazi Germany, because the military situation provided them with quick enrichment. The successful German offensive on the Eastern Front was accompanied by frenzied police terror. Military field courts worked around the clock, handing down hundreds of death sentences. Many communists were hanged or shot, and prisons and concentration camps were filled with people who, against all odds, sought freedom and fought hard for it. After brutal beatings and torture in July 1942, the members and staff of the party's Central Committee among them Central Committee member Anton Ivanov and national poet Nikola Vapsarov, were shot, and many old communists had been in prison for 10 or 15 years. The illegal work of the party was entrusted to its most experienced cadres, professional revolutionaries over whom the threat of capture and reprisals constantly hung. Parts of the Bulgarian army at this time were sent by the fascist government into the territory of Yugoslavia and Greece and fought against the liberation movement of the peoples of these countries. Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union, which brought incalculable misery and grief, aroused anger and indignation not only among the Soviet people. In all honest people it gave rise to an unprecedented and unheard of hatred and disgust towards fascism, because Hitler sought to destroy first the Soviet Union and after him all the Slavic peoples. In fascism the progressive circles, communist and workers' parties saw the worst enemy of mankind, brutally destroying everything advanced. Therefore, the communists of the whole world rose to the struggle. Without sparing any effort, 
the Bulgarian Workers' Party joined in this struggle. It well understood that the war against the Soviet Union was a war, leading to the destruction of the conquests of all progressive humanity, a war against the bulwark of the workers' movement in all colonial, semi-colonial and dependent countries. She understood that the war against the Soviet system is a war against all communists, and on its outcome depends on whether or not to be socialism. Correctly assessing the political situation, the Bulgarian Workers' Party immediately after the outbreak of war took the course of armed struggle. Military commissions were set up in the central and district committees of the party and in the Union of Working Youth, whose direct task was to train party members and members of the Union of Youth in Military Affairs, to supply them with weapons and to direct the activities of the combat groups and the already formed partisan Shiti detachments. The party called on the communists to fight for the overthrow of the fascist regime in the country. It put forward two main slogans under which the struggle was to unfold. Not a single grain of Bulgarian wheat for fascist Germany, and not a single Bulgarian soldier on the Eastern Front against the Soviet Union. In deciding on the armed uprising, the Central Committee of the party had full knowledge of the difficulties that would accompany the whole work of preparing and carrying out the armed struggle but it had behind it many years of experience in revolutionary work. The experience of the Vladai and September uprisings, the experience of the partisan struggle of 1925 and a long period of underground struggle. All this rich experience gave the Central Committee confidence that the struggle would end in success. With this faith, the party called upon its members and the entire people to fight relentlessly against the hated fascism. The party's call was answered at the first moment by the bravest and most devoted sons and daughters of the people. They put the interests of the fatherland above their personal interests. They parted from their loved ones and embarked on the path of a difficult, but therefore noble struggle, the struggle for the liberation of the country from fascist slavery. Finally, the meeting with Yakim took place. The conversation was brief and businesslike. Yakim was now even more reserved and stingy with his words. The matter is of such a nature, he said, that you will have to leave immediately. Where to? Go to Trine and Bresnik district, he answered and added. There is an instruction from the party to raise the people to the struggle. Firstly, to strengthen the party leadership and organizations in the localities. Secondly, where they do not exist, to create them anew. And thirdly, to begin to form fighting groups, partisan cells and detachments to fight against the fascist power. Use your old connections and get going. We will meet at this place on the 1st, 10th and 20th of each month. For long days and sleepless nights of waiting, I mentally went over everything that could be assigned to me according to the modest position I occupied in the party. The assignment I received exceeded all my expectations and assumptions. What Comrade Yakim informed me of was not only unexpected for me, but at first glance seemed simply impossible. Comrades Milan Atanasov, Harambi Zakaryev and Georgi Rangelov, with whom I shared my thoughts about my upcoming work, thought the same. They knew well the situation in our colony, and I always considered their opinion. I consulted them this time, too, to dispel my hesitation, but they were also concerned about the fact that in spring, summer and fall, the men in Trinska Okolia were not at home. There were only women, old people, children and a small part of the youth. It was clear that the party and youth organizations would be empty at that time, and I would have no one to rely on to carry out these tasks. Of course, we were wrong. And first of all, because we underestimated women who felt the economic and political grip more than anyone else, and we underestimated the youth who are quickly inspired and are the first to respond to the call to struggle. In our one-sided judgments, we neglected both the revolutionary history of the Trinitarian Party organization and the freedom-loving traditions of the older generation, which had fought for national independence for many years. There were, of course, some difficulties in Bresnik or Kolya, but they were of a different nature and were not particularly alarming. Therefore, the comrade from the county committee had the right to firmly insist on the party decision and demand its implementation. I did not object any more and set to work but I still believed that he should have prepared me for this assignment in advance and only then familiarized me with the task. I set off. It was necessary to get there on foot, and it was about a hundred kilometers from Sofia to Trina Okolia, two or three days' journey for a good walker. But that's not enough. The road had to be chosen so that it would be safe for the advancement of dozens of fighters who would soon receive their combat assignment just like me. 
which required a careful check not only of the route, but also of the people with whom we would have to keep in touch. Afterwards, our lives would be entirely in their hands. In carrying out such a serious task, it was highly desirable for me to have at least one trusted comrade. I asked Bai Yakim for permission to do so and suggested Slavcho Tetsvetkov, my fellow countryman teacher, who had also been tried for his anti-fascist activities. Bai Yakim agreed. During my gymnasium years and later, I walked from trying to Sofia many times. This made it easier for me. Most of the way was familiar to me. I knew where I could walk straight ahead, where I could take a circuitous route. These were the paths travelled by many communists and farmers loyal to the nation to their last breath, who were brutally persecuted for their political views. They sought refuge in Fraterna Yugoslavia after the fascist coup and the September 1923 armed uprising. Vasil Levski, a tireless fighter for the pure and holy republic and for the freedom to which he devoted his life and for which the generations that followed him, deceived and robbed by those who seized power, had to fight again and again, and for which we too, learned from the experience of our fathers and grandfathers, have now risen to fight, to the traces of the former fighters survive to this day not on the ground. The old paths quickly overgrow with weeds, the wind covers them with sand, the rains erode them, the scorching sun dries them up. These traces have survived above all in the minds of ordinary peasants, who are no less devoted to the common cause than their grandfathers, who sheltered and saved our predecessors. On these people, on their sons and daughters, we, the men of the new epoch, the, the continuers of the cause of the old revolutionaries, were now counting. I took with me proclamations, several issues of the newspaper Robotnichsko Delo and the programme of the Fatherland Front. This program had just been drawn up by the leader of our party, Georgi Dimitrov, and promulgated by the underground radio station Risto Boat. The Fatherland Front represented a fighting alliance of all the progressive forces of the country fighting against fascism, and its tasks were formulated so briefly, with such extreme clarity, that it seemed to me as if Dimitrov, having read my thoughts, the thoughts of the whole nation, had only put them together and arranged them in a certain order, and therefore reading this document. You involuntarily perceived everything as your own blood, long known to you. The programme demanded that Bulgaria should in no case go together with Germany. We have already suffered once from such an alliance with Germany, it said, and no one wants to see it nailed to the shameful pole again. It is necessary to demand that the government break the alliance with the Axis powers, immediately withdraw the Bulgarian troops from the occupied countries and expel the Germans from Bulgaria. After all, the Serbs and Greeks are fighting for the same things as we are, and the Tsarist troops are tying their hands as much as ours, and the fascist bayonet is blocking their way as much as ours. The program went on to provide political freedoms for the people and amnesty, for all those imprisoned and convicted for anti-fascist activity, demanding the disarming of fascist thugs, the disbanding of fascist organisations, work and human conditions of life for all workers. The solution of these urgent tasks for our people, the programme said, requires us to establish as soon as possible a truly national government capable of carrying out firmly and consistently the salutary policy of the Fatherland Front. In the name of this, the Home Front has set as the immediate goal of its struggle the overthrow of the power of the treacherous anti-people pro-Hitler government and the establishment of a truly Bulgarian national government. For the realisation of the programme of the Home Front, it was necessary to activate the existing party and youth organisations urgently, without delay to bring them to combat readiness. At the same time, it was necessary to search for and find sympathisers of us, party members who had broken away from the organisation, workers of other parties who were advocating the national independence of Bulgaria, all those women and men who loved their motherland and hated fascism and fascists. There were many such people in the towns and villages, and it was necessary to involve them in active work. In the leadership we included Nako Stanikov, Stanka Jurova, Meladin Jurova and others, all from Trina Okoya. Dencho was from the village of Yolopsi. I knew him from the gymnasium in Triain as an active member of the Workers' Youth Union, whom the police did not leave alone. Several times he left the police station beaten to a pulp, but this not only did not make him leave the labour movement, but, on the contrary, bound him to it even more firmly. Modest to the point of shyness, honest and hard-working, Densho enjoyed the trust and sympathy of both the pupils of the Trina Gymnasium and the construction workers. That is why I, having gone underground, began to keep in touch with the construction workers through De 
I gave the materials, both those I received from the district committee and those I printed myself, to Densho, and he distributed them among the other comrades responsible for the communities. In this way they flowed from organization to organization and from person to person. One day Comrade Yakim informed me that he intended to entrust me with some serious task in the near future and warned me not to share it with anyone. From that day on, I was always in anticipation of something new, exciting, unknown. I continued to live in Basil Petrov's apartment throughout May and June. Other underground fighters came there, and the danger that one day we would all be captured there was very real. Naturally, I had to get out of there. I moved in with Milan Atanasov, a construction worker, at that time one of the active members of the Trozinski Party organization. He lived in the Ovcha Kupel neighborhood and rented the ground floor of a two-story house. There were many instructive pages in the life of this prematurely graying man. Modest and industrious, he had long ago won the affection of the builders of Trina, and they followed him more than once when he called for a strike. Despite the police repression to which he was often subjected, Mancho stood firmly at his fighting post and served as an example of a true revolutionary. My moving in with him was not accidental. We were both linked by a series of joint actions against the fascist authorities in the countryside and in Sofia, and most of all by the construction workers' strike of July 1938. From him I received for the first time brochures of communist content and fiction, Aitu Tsushima, Mother and others. These books which he recommended me to read made a great impression on me and left me with a feeling of deep respect for this man. At that time I quite naturally identified Mancho himself with the images of the heroes of the books I had read and I considered the relationship of the Pasha, despite the difference in age, to be friendly. The same relations were established between me and his childhood friend Karolambi Zakaryev, who was also not a young man, skinny as a dried mackerel, but unusually healthy and hardy. Both he and Mancho were excellent masters of plaster details, and lovingly taught their craft to a large group of apprentices, tomorrow's masters. Both had wonderful wives, kind and cordial, though very different in temperament. If Ephrosina, Mancho's wife, was a calm, balanced woman, although sometimes succumbed to longing and despair, then Haralambia's wife, Palia, was always cheerful, talkative, quick to work, but constantly as if in some nervous tension. In spite of these differences in character, both were equally valuable and indispensable to our harbourers. While I was living in Milan's apartment, a woman from a village in Trina suddenly moved in on the second floor of the same building apparently because of its proximity to the mineral springs of Ovcha Capelli, thinking that she did not know me. I did not greet her in the courtyard or on the stairs and did not speak to her. She would look at me slyly with the corner of her eye as if to say, you're pretending, but I'll get you out of this. One morning, when I was reading in the yard, she stopped beside me and began to question, Mertewi, what are you doing here, young man? I'm a student, studying for my exams. Where are you from? From Ferdinand Okoya, I answered her and immediately thought that my conspiracy was over. And what is your name? She asked me persistently, as if she had caught me in the act. Mitko, I said, counting on the fact that Mancha's wife had also called me by that name, and that the neighbours knew me by that name. You are Slavcho from Bohova. Why are you deceiving me? Because I know you and your mother well. She comes to our mill. The woman continued to explain the origins of our acquaintance at length. If that is so, then there is no need to ask, I told her. I knew we knew each other, so I made a joke. I wanted to see if you were a physiognomist. Yeah, but I'm an old man, so why are you messing with me? What's the big deal? You can joke with everyone, both young and old, I answered the curious woman and stared at the book. Realising that I have no desire to talk, she stepped aside, took off the bathrobe hanging on the fence, and went to take a bath. Although the conversation was innocent, the woman knew that I lived here and could have given me away without wanting to. In the evening, Mancho came in. I told him what had happened, and we decided to tell our neighbour the truth and warn her not to say anything to anyone. It turned out that soon her husband came here too. It turned out to be Tudor Stoyshev, or as everyone called him, by Tocho from the village of Zabel, with whom we were well acquainted. He had once been a chauffeur and many times gave me, a student of the Trina Gymnasium, a free ride in an automobile to the city, so that I would not tear my shoes and would be on time for the beginning of classes. How many times the pupils stained the beautiful upholstery of the car with sour milk, and he only shook his head, 
muttering curses good-naturedly under his nose, and Now that's it. You will never see a car again. You are not studying, but herding cows. But some time would pass, and we would again get into the car with Bay Tosho, and so on year after year, as long as his motor was humming, though he never took a penny from any of us. We were his best performing customers. Later he sold the car and bought a mill, but even after becoming a miller he was still a kind, helpful man still standing on communist positions. When exactly he came to us in Opte Cupel, I did not see. I met him one morning in the corridor and realized from the expression on his face that his wife had initiated him into our conversation. He said hello and his first words, It's very audible, that damn car. The owners will guess and give you away. I was surprised. What car are we talking about? About the one you're typing on. It's been running all night. I can hear everything. Isn't there any way to keep the noise down? To show rebuked me. I could not understand where he got the idea that someone was typing. So I tried to assure him that I had no typewriter and could not use it. He looked at me in a peculiar way, as if he wanted to say, You can't fool me. I'm a sparrow. Or maybe he was even offended that I was hiding such a small thing from him, a communist. Only when I shared my doubts with Mancho and his wife, it turned out that the knocking sound was made by the cradle in which Ifrazina was rocking little Vasco. Having laughed heartily at the excessive suspicion of Bai Tosho, I dispelled his doubts and calmed myself. Even at this first conversation he assured me that he would keep everything secret, and on leaving he left me 250 livres. Soon Mancho's family left for the village of Hlavanovtsi, his native place. In one of the rooms of the lower floor, with his consent, again for the sake of mineral baths, some old lady from Sofia and her little grandson moved in. She was very hospitable and morbidly curious. She was constantly receiving and seeing off guests and never ceased to be interested in my personality. To satisfy her curiosity, I introduced myself as a student of theology, having previously learned the names of almost all the professors of the theological faculty. But this only caused me more trouble, for the lady was acquainted with many of them, and I was now and then put in an awkward position without thinking things over in time and to the end. Besides, she was very devout and took every opportunity to question me as to the meaning and significance of various religious ordinances, and here I was quite helpless. But this was not the only reason why I had to leave this otherwise comfortable apartment. My neighbour had various visitors, and as far as I could judge from her undisguised sympathy for the Nazis, all her guests were our enemies. The only exception, it seems, was her son-in-law, so she was looking for an opportunity to replace him with a more suitable one. I had to leave Mancho's apartment for a while. But where to go? There were few acquaintances with whom I could hang. The sunny and hot July came to my rescue. Grasses were blooming in the lush meadows, and the air was full of their fragrance. Now I could sleep in the open air without a bed or blanket. One day, not far from Mancho's house, an elderly peasant was cutting grass, barely moving his blunt scythe. Looking at him, I felt my former passion for mowing flare up in me, and I couldn't help myself and went straight to him. Sweat was trickling down his sunburned face. His shirt was soaked. His hands were trembling. I tried mowing, though it had been a long time since I had picked up a scythe, but I had retained my skills. However, the scythe was very dull. The milkweed had formed a green crust on its blade, which made it slip on the grass like a stick. I hastily beat the scythe back, sharpened it, and let it walk across the meadow. Now it plunged deep and hissing like a snake threw off the lush grass in even rows, and the ground behind it became like a freshly shaved head. My friendship with Kristen began back in 1940, after I moved to a new apartment in the Banishaw neighbourhood. We met him by chance, when I was collecting signatures in the houses of my neighbourhood in support of the proposal of the Soviet representative, A, so believed to conclude a non-aggression pact between Bulgaria and the USSR. Not only Kristan himself put his signature to this proposal, but also all his relatives who lived with him. A remarkable trait in the character of this young man was his inexhaustible enthusiasm. Kristen lit up like gunpowder and would not allow any work to be done without his participation. After my arrest, assuming that it was due to the slogans we had written together, Kristen left his apartment and hid with some member of our organisation. The rest of the comrades remained where they were. We were all well aware of the police practice of secondly arresting those released after a trial, and sending them to concentration camps to be slowly but surely killed there for years, subjecting them to systematic starvation. This would have awaited me too, 
if I had not taken action in time. That's why I left my apartment the very next day and moved in with Vasil Petrov. Vasil was a communist. He lived in the Krasnoselo neighborhood and had his own locksmith shop. His brother Demo, also a party member, and five or six other apprentices worked there. I had known Vasil for quite some time. More than once he came to help me, and our friendship became such that we no longer called each other by name, but simply brother. Although Vasil was from Bresnik, he considered himself a true Sofia resident. The apartment he rented on Babadag Street, in the same neighborhood as the workshop, was inconvenient for my illegal stay. There were other families living in the house whom I did not know and had no right to trust. I didn't think Vasil should risk his family's safety for my sake. Vasil, a former boxer, had a broken nose, which reminded him of the competitions Vasil had won and lost. He talked about them with enthusiasm. Vasil was a hot-tempered man. This hotness manifested itself in his affairs and in disputes. Two meter tall, strongly built, with well-developed muscles, he was not only imposing, but simply formidable. It was not without reason that some alien elements, hating him, in fear of his strength, had to take off their hats and greet him courteously from afar. Vasil's apprentices were also good fellows. Some of them were members of the Union of Working Youth, others sympathized with him. There was a room at the workshop. It served as a storage room, but two of the apprentices slept in it. At first I slept with them and even took up learning locksmithing. But soon the environment changed, through comrades with whom I kept in touch. It became known that the police were looking for me at my sister's apartment and at the insurance company where I had worked before my arrest. This clearly indicated that half measures were no longer sufficient and that it was necessary to go completely illegal. One day I told Vasil about it and asked for advice. You should go into hiding, brother, he advised me. Our apartment is at your disposal. We were brothers before, and now even more so. Whoever doesn't want to take risks has no right to become a communist. Vasil knew partly about my activities and even helped me himself. He listened to the radio, recorded the most important data, and knew the hiding place where my primitive printing press was kept, which had been moved to his apartment. In addition, Vasil helped me to carry out communication with the town of Bresnik, for which I was responsible to Andrei Penev, the instructor of the Sofia District Committee. On Comrade Penev's recommendation, I was relieved of my work with the youth in the Banisher neighborhood in order to get seriously involved with the construction workers from our Trina Oakley, of whom there were several thousand in Sofia. By the very nature of their profession, they belonged to the category of those workers who were the most difficult to organize, requiring serious effort and hard work. Other comrades who had gone underground also began to use Vasil's apartment. Andrei Penev, Georgi Pavlov and Mara Petlyakova visited. Vasil's cheerful and boisterous wife was as fearless as he was. She accepted everyone with an open mind and only from time to time jokingly, so that I did not think that she was hinting that I should leave their house. Oh, brother, I wonder when we shall talk. Hey, you'd better keep an eye on the child so that the child doesn't tell anyone rather than talk nonsense. Vaso sharply interrupted her. They had a little daughter. Before she called me Uncle Slavcho, but now she suddenly had to call me Uncle Boris. It was an impossible task for her. Little Lilia did not understand the purpose of this game of names, and every time she addressed me, she stammered and called me Uncle Slau. I'd already known Andrei Penny for a year. He was responsible to the district committee for party work in Trinska and Bresnika Oki, and often visited my apartment and later the apartment of Krista Kristanov. Baya Andrei was an interesting person. Already at the first glance, I remembered his face, large cheekbones, puffy eyes and grey, shortly trimmed moustache. He became even more interesting to me when I got to know him better. My life had taught by Andrei a lot. He rose from a simple bricklayer to a member of the Central Committee of the BP. At different periods, the people elected him as a district councillor and a deputy to the People's Assembly. There was no area in which by Andrei did not look into, and with which he was not familiar. He also learned what it was like to be a prisoner during the First World War, and was closely acquainted with the fire department. Even before the September uprising, he had helped to carry weapons out of the barracks for the party men in danger, had served as a courier between the Soviet Union and our party, and after the Russian Civil War by Andre had ferried flour and other food for the starving workers of Sevastopol. This old party man was wounded more than once. The scars from his wounds often reminded him of the skirmishes with the police in the neighborhood of Varna, 
when he tried to hide the weapons he himself had delivered on the Black Sea. The old revolutionary was also familiar with the sufferings of a prisoner. He had been imprisoned and released several times, but the longest time the Nazis kept him imprisoned was after 1929. Now, in 1942, a heavy sentence in absentia was hanging over by André. Since the Sofia police did not know him, he took no special measures to hide. He visited coffee houses, walked around the city during the day, ate in restaurants and rode on streetcars. Kristen and I were always worried that he might not fall into a trap somewhere, and often said to him, By André, be careful, or you will be captured. And he would reply, but he would replacas do not know me here. If it had been in Varna, I wouldn't have poked my nose out of the street there. Sometimes Bai Andre came with me to the party meetings of the construction workers, listened patiently to what they had to say, and at the end he took the floor himself. He always spoke briefly. Sometimes his speeches dealt with specific cases at the site where the gathered workers were working. Other times he told them about the life of the Soviet people, about the revolution, about electrification, about socialism. Prisium for the first time asked me, is he a Bulgarian? Such doubt was caused by the oriental features of his face and the Turkish words, proverbs and wise sayings he often used. By Andre had a lively and sharp mind. He never lost his way and was never at a loss for a word. Once he and I came to Kristen's house and he invited us to have dinner. He had prepared pork brisket with beans, which was our distinguished guest's favorite dish. Kristen covered the table with a newspaper, brought bread and a pot of food, and sat down to buy André. There were two kinds of bread on the table. One was bread bought at the bakery, and the other was village bread from Boduyak. Of course, there could be no comparison between them. The homemade bread was wheat bread, tall, a full inch high, and white as snow, while the store-bought bread was dark, with oat bran and viscous like clay, a mishmash of all kinds of waste. I cut a few slices of one and the other bread and put them in front of each of them. Bai Andre looked at it, looked at it, swore in Turkish, took a slice of the black bread that lay before him, and throwing it away. Now I work not for black bread, but for white bread. Let those who are unable to give the people white bread eat it. By Andrew, it is a sin to throw bread, said Kristen jokingly. The sin is not on my soul but on the souls of those who give us bread made of all kinds of scraps and give chintz to their German masters. But a little time passed and Bar André failed. It turned out that he was riding in a streetcar from Sofia to Niagivo and caught the eye of experienced agents. He was immediately arrested. Thus our dear friend became the victim of his own carelessness. Another man was sent in his place in June of the same year. Compared to Bar André, he was younger and much more reserved in conversation, but his smile and look were sly and portended either extreme seriousness or unexpected irony. Of himself he said nothing. Who he was, where he came from, what his profession was, I did not know and did not try to find out, since the slightest curiosity was contrary to the rules of party conspiracy. For me, Stoyan Neshev from the village of Ujichin in Lovch district was just Comrade Yakim. Our meetings took place only in the evenings and in different places. Unlike by Andre, Comrade Joachim was exceptionally cautious. I did not like his excessive strictness. It was as if he himself deliberately prevented any intimacy, kept at a distance, but I felt that he trusted me completely. Little by little I got used to his character, and in time he became more sociable. Although at that time I did not know the functions of either by Andre or his successor, this did not prevent me from carrying out all their instructions in a timely and most precise manner. For me, these comrades were the central committee of the party, and their word was law. The life of the Trinian builders was miserable and joyless. Temporary residents of the places where construction sites sprang up usually rented cellars and attics and lived 10 to 15 people to a room. Most workers cooked their own food and took it with them to work. The contractors did not provide them with a permanent place to work, so they spent about six months in the village. Although the interruption in work was not their fault, no one paid them for the downtime, and so in the end their average earnings were so low that it was not even enough to feed their families, let alone dress decently. Like migratory birds, every spring on the first day of Lent the Trinkens left their homes and returned home only in the fall, after Nicolene's day, when the cold weather came and work on the construction sites was curtailed. During the whole working season they lived away from their families and cherished every penny they earned. 
The transition from one construction site to another was a common phenomenon for them, and therefore no organization, neither party, nor youth, nor professional. Builders were like cranes, which also now and then fly from place to place. Among the construction workers, there were many conscious and advanced people. It was these people that the communists organized, and in order to improve their situation, more than once involved them in strikes, and when the situation demanded it, the same workers organized fly-in meetings in the streets, and at them presented their demands to the bourgeois, the state trade unions, or the government. In the history of the labor movement in Sofia, the construction workers played a paramount role, and were always distinguished by their steadfastness and persistence in achieving their demands. Many construction workers have been in the bloody custody of the police. Some were tried, others were beaten mercilessly, but the struggle did not weaken, it grew and grew. Difficulties with the organization of the builders forced us to hold a meeting in February 1942 with the most active youth of the Ocalia, at which we discussed this issue thoroughly and decided to attach to each community a comrade responsible for it. The comrades in charge of the community constituted the leadership, which, relying on a wide range of activists, was to carry out party decisions, supply the party groups in the communities with legal and illegal literature, organize and hold party meetings, and carry out agitation and outreach work among the builders. How the situation may change, Nino persisted. The Russians are just about to invent some new weapon and pop, a turn in the course of the war. Imagine, for example, tank carriers, such a big tank Matka, and in his belly a few smaller tanks. Such a tank carrier stops, automatically opens and out of it crawl the baby tanks or new underground airfields from where, like wasps, airplanes fly out in swarms. The Germans will bite. Oh ho ho, they'll bite. Oh ho ho, they'll bite. I wish I could ask them how they'll get back to Germany. Oh, if only I hadn't been convicted, then I'd have sent at least one blonde beast to the other side of the world. Nino spoke in a defiantly cheeky way. He wanted to cheer up both his companions, so he laughed loudly. Sasho the little raised his head, fixed his blonde bangs with his hands, smiled, and looked affectionately at the cheerful Nino. You're a fool, Nino. You laugh, but do you know how I feel? I know. It's hard for you. Your girl's pining and you're here. It's hard for me too, but what can you do? Not everything depends on us. Fate. And he sang in his husky voice. Oh, fate, fate. So you decided that I should see her in the arms of another. Hey. Leave the girls until peaceful times and hurry up with your letters. Sasho Big interrupted him. Or the warden will be here in a minute. Yes, that's right. I was distracted and I haven't written the most important thing yet, Nino said and taking up his pencil, began to string his beads again. For ten minutes everyone was silent. It seemed that the chamber was empty, everyone staring at the paper, mentally talking to their loved ones. The clock of the trade school struck five beats. On other days, its chiming was barely audible, but now it seemed to be at the very walls of the prison. Although I was reluctant to interrupt this uncensored conversation, I had to remind my comrades that it was time to stop, for it would take some time to hide the letters. Done, said Nino. What is there to write so much more? The most important thing is to let my uncle know that he must keep his eyes open and not be taken alive by those bastards. My girl and I have already talked about it. If I am condemned, she will wait. If she is condemned, I will wait, but yours will surely abandon you. Nino tried again to cheer up his comrades, but now they were all out of fun. Every minute the warden might come in and catch them unprepared. I didn't know any of these guys before prison. We all came from different places and were of different ages, but the ideas of communism had brought us together and made us feel as if we had known each other for many years. As I have already mentioned, Sasho Big was a carpenter and Sasho Little was a foundry worker. They behaved honorably during the investigation and before the Nazi court. Both loved labor and were devoted to the labor movement. Sasho Malenki's despondency was temporary. He was aware that, although there were many difficulties on our way, and that arrest and prison might await a member of the Workers' Youth Union, he had to keep his honor as a communist sacred everywhere no matter what position the enemy put him in. Although I had no organizational or merely personal connection with the two Sashos, the police made a joint case against us, and it was to my lawyer's credit that he was able to show all the stitches soon with white threads that artificially linked my and their activities. 
The operation of concealing the letters was quite complicated. For each letter I had to tear a piece of the lining of my jacket and then sew it up again. Footsteps sounded in the hallway. Borsho heels clattered distinctly on the cement floor. Warden said Sasho Big. Hear him? He's coming. All those sitting on the bunks stood up as if on command. Let's say goodbye before he unlocks the cell, Sasho continued. We won't be able to hug or say anything to each other in front of him. The five comrades hugged me tightly, kissed me and promised never to whimper and never to lose faith in their... Sasho Bolshoi's words sounded in my ears for a long time afterwards. Tell the comrades that we have not betrayed anyone and that even unarmed we continue the struggle. Not everything had been said yet when the iron deadbolt rattled and the wrinkled figure of our warden appeared in the doorway. Hey, you still not ready? Ready, Mr. Warden, ready, I answered ironically and hurried to grab my belongings. The words Mr. Warden usually worked like oil on his menial soul, but this time my irony made him angry. Oh, communists, he growled. Revolutionaries, too, he added with a sneer, and, pushing me out of the cell, he slammed the door shut with all his might. The prison authorities aimed to traumatize the prisoners' nervous systems in every possible way. They deprived him of sleep by rattling the dead boats and peering into their cells. The sentries in the corridors pounded their boots deliberately loudly, all in order to cause a nervous breakdown. The fascist authorities wanted to establish such a regime in the prisons that even if one of the convicts survived, he would remain an inferior human being. In the corridor we met only a sentry. He looked through the peephole into each cell and shouted at the prisoners not to laugh or speak loudly. For four whole hours he had to repeat the same thing continuously. Toward the end he would get tired and do it carelessly, and then there would be peace for the prisoners. I cast one last glance at the wheel. It was a sort of deep well, enclosed by the railing of a staircase, and it was frightening even to look into it. The well was now covered with wire mesh, a precautionary measure to prevent those who could not endure the abuse of the jailers, or who had become nervous as a result of their abuse, from throwing themselves into it. Not one, but many, before the netting was put in place, found their end in this well. Here is the little basement wicket through which the prisoners go for a walk into the prison yard. There is a narrow path through a tiny green patch. Although the movement along it is always in the same direction, the prisoners are happy to be able to see each other, exchange thoughts, pass on news, and breathe fresh air. However, no one has the right to step a single step off the path. Everyone knows that the guards on the towers have the right to shoot anyone who steps off the path without warning. I also have memories of this place. Here I was trained to defend myself in court. The party is alive and active in prison. It has its own organization, its own leadership. Comrades from the leadership study every newly arrived prisoner and then prepare him for the trial. Experienced communists explain to the young that it is necessary to refuse the testimony given at the preliminary investigation and to hold up honorably at the trial before the representatives of the fascist authorities. Comrade Komitov, one of those party figures who received the harshest sentences at the trial of the postal workers, dealt with me. He listened to me attentively. He studied in detail the circumstances of my arrest, my behavior during the investigation, the content of the charge, and advised me how to stand up in court. Since you did not confess to communist activity during the investigation, Komitov said, continue to insist on your testimony. It will only be to your advantage. Stick to your testimony about the physical evidence as well. The judges cannot prove otherwise. There is not a day in prison when there is not a clash between the prisoners and the jailers. No matter how good you are, the warders will always find a reason to berate you. One day I went to take a bath. Since I'd been given soap, I decided to wash myself thoroughly. It felt so good to splash water on myself that I forgot the warden existed. I soaped myself again and again. Suddenly he yelled at me so loudly that I dropped the soap from my hands. Why are you scrubbing yourself? You're not going to the party. You'd think that your father and grandfather only washed with soap, he yelled. Your grandfather didn't have electricity either, but you do. I told him as sharply as I could to avenge my fright. Shut up, you bastard, shouted the warden even harder. And don't object or I'll beat you with my truncheon. Then you'll be jumping on my baton. There was a barber shop in the prison. One day I wanted a haircut, so I asked the warden to let me have one. He took me in. 
But it wasn't a haircut, it was a painful pulling out of my hair, and I had tears in my eyes. Esther, you're not cutting my hair, you're tearing it out. I can't stand it. Did I force you here? said the barber resentfully and, pulling off my soiled napkin, which would be more likely to be a dusty rag, yelled, Get out of here. Go find yourself a better handyman. My first memory of being in prison was again connected with the corridor through which the warden had just led me. That day we had been brought here from the 5th police station, where we had been held until the indictment was handed down, and as we were walking down this corridor, the guard pushed me so hard and unexpectedly that I fell to the floor. There was no reason for the kick, except that I allowed myself to look at the walls. This time, when the warder had gone to the archives to draw up the documents for my release, I decided to look thoroughly at everything that I had not been allowed to see, thus arousing in me even more curiosity. Between the portraits of the members of the royal family could be seen the ineptly made, almost erased emblem of our party and the slogan down with fascism. So the hand of the party touched here too, I thought, and only now realised why we were forbidden to stop in the corridor and look at the walls cut. At last the formalities were over. The iron gate that had let me in a few hours ago opened, and I found myself on the street. I walked along the sidewalk, but I could not get rid of the thought that someone was following me. I stopped, bent over, ostensibly to fix a loose shoelace on my shoe, and looked back. No one was following me. Relieved that I was free again and that no one was following me, I crossed Oridge Street and walked quickly down the dirty sidewalk toward the house where I lived. My sympathy for my comrades left in prison grew with every step that took me further away from them. And here I was on Kavala Street, in front of house number 13. A fatal number, more than once the ridiculous thought crossed my mind that it was the reason for my arrest. I found no one in the apartment. My sister Nadia had gone out. I found the key to my room, unlocked the door. Everything was just as I'd left it. But my first concern was not to see what and how, but to find the rifle and cartridges which I'd got with Kristen Kristinov and hidden in our attic under a thick beam, as well as the primitive equipment with which I was printing a bulletin about events at the front, not finding them. I was not surprised. I knew that the comrades of the neighbourhood organisation would certainly see to it that they were rescued, and I was not mistaken. Kristen, Emil Georgiev, and my brother Nikola did so, that same evening my sister told me about the activities of our organisation and about the closest comrades she knew. That Berto Kahlo, who was responsible for the sector, had not been arrested, I knew. Elise Milev, who had been in charge of the sector before Kahlo, was also at large. I happened to notice both of them in the street as I was being led to court. This unexpected meeting with responsible comrades from the neighbourhood organisation at that time encouraged me very much and put me in a good mood. Kristen Kristanov, with whom we were very close, and with whom we wrote slogans together on the steps of the craft school, the night before my arrest, was in an illegal position. It was he who is one of the first to demand that my apartment be cleared of compromising materials, and then organised my defence at the trial. Kristan was a native of the village of Volyek in Sofia County. He studied finance and administration. He earned his livelihood by working for a lawyer. Miss Lawyer, at Kristen's request, became my defence attorney. Every year on August 2, a fair was organised in the village of Slis of Sea. Boys and girls from the neighbouring villages gathered there to have fun, and the communists used the fair for organisational work. This was also a great opportunity for us to meet some of the young people, so we went to Slis of Sea. I knew the village and its people like the back of my hand. My mother was from the village, my older sister lived there, and I'd spent several years there myself. The Slisov Party organisation was one of the best in the Oakley. Blagoy Stratiev grew up in it, and later almost all the youth and the whole village were under the influence of the communists. In Slisov Sea I lived my, perhaps, best years. Here I indulged in my youthful dreams. Read a lot, prepared to take extern exams after I was expelled from the gymnasium, and participated in the party life of the Slisov Sea people. The Slisov Seans are located at the foot of Mount Bolshaya Rudina. On the other side of the mountain, to the north, are the Serbian villages of Kravina Jabuka, Kauna and Darkovci, and to the west is Krane Trave, a large mountain village torn into dozens of parts and scattered on the slopes of Virtok, Gora and Kemenik, one of the best bases of the Yugoslav partisans in the area. There was no other village in Trinska Okolia that suffered so much from mountain streams as Slisovti. 
There were cases when such avalanches of water, stones and sand fell down deep ravines and hollows that even the most massive village buildings could not resist them. As a result of such repeated flooding, the whole village was covered with stones and sand. But as much as it abounded in stones, it was so poor in water. The water sweeps everything down on us, and we have no water, the peasants joke bitterly. In summer, when the stony soil heats up, the heat becomes unbearable, even wood and stone crack from the heat. There are fine young people in the village. The recent green youths with whom we read books together looked at the albums of the communist magazine Pogord and threatened the rich, were now members of the Union of Working Youth and independently oriented in complex events. The biggest enthusiasts at that time were Mitko Granitov and Dragomir Ignatov. They worked together with Vlado Marianov and Stefan Rangelov, the former from Stresimiropsi and the latter from Raneluji, and were inseparable friends. These villages were so close to each other that the young men felt at home in each of them. Although they were members of different organizations, each knew who was doing what work, and in many cases they discussed together what to do and how to take up a new cause. The meeting was to be held in the grove above the village. A very narrow circle of young people was notified about it, who were then to set new tasks for the members of the village organization and carry them. The boys were not notified in advance what questions would be discussed, but they guessed that the meeting would take place in the forest. The matter was to be important. And here in a pine grove with rare oaks and hawthorn bushes, one after another came ten guys. They came here with a trembling heart, and when we gathered, we all, although it was not customary among underground fighters, hugged each other tightly, filled with a warm sense of comradeship. Everyone sat down, closely pressed against each other. Naturally, first of all, it was necessary to satisfy the avid curiosity of those gathered, to explain why we had taken refuge in the forest and what our secret meeting obliged us to do. The boys must have felt the same, if not greater. Excitement as I did when the instructor of the district committee suddenly informed me that I was to go on such an important mission to Bresnik and Trinsk district. And these guys were much younger than me. They greedily absorbed every word of the party and were ready to give their young lives for it. They listened as only youth can listen, concentrated with eyes wide open. When words like uprising, gun, bomb or struggle were uttered, their eyes lit up and the very thought that the party and the union of working youth entrusted them with such an important task and looked upon them as mature patriotic citizens brought a colour of proud excitement to their faces. They were mentally transported to the combat situation as if on a screen seeing everything that their ardent young imagination could draw. The idea of fighting the enemy was intertwined with partisan glory, with revolutionary romance. When I was talking about collecting food, Mitko Granitov interrupted me and said, ah, this is the easiest. We'll raid the fields of the rural rich and there you have it. Corn, potatoes, beans, but not only food. We also need weapons, comrades. We have weapons immediately informed Vlado Marianov. Are you talking only about yourself or about the others too? Oh, about everyone, comrade Slavcho, repeated Vlado. Our weapons are in full combat readiness. Well done. And how do you expect to get money? After all, we need money too. At first, we will have to buy clothes, shoes. And it's not difficult, Ryko from Bohova hastened to declare. We'll organize one or two parties and we'll have money in our pockets. Hmm. How come? Money in your pocket. Very simple. The end justifies the means. Let's sell more tickets and report less. Financial control is in our hands, Ryko added confident. The boys had a chance to speak about the tasks set before them. They fully supported the party's line of arms struggle and pointed out from whom they could borrow or buy weapons. It became clear how they would get potatoes, beans, corn, lard and other products how and from whom they would store them, how they could get money, on whom they would entrust the construction of dugouts, what new forms to use to influence the soldiers, and to expose the treacherous policy of the fascist government, how to make a mass youth organization. It was decided to pay more attention to village gatherings. A lot of people gather there, and if you skillfully approach it, it is possible to carry out the work needed by the party. They act, but act cautiously. If trouble happens to anyone, know that communists sacrifice themselves, their lives, for the sake of the organization. We are my last word. Let's swear. Vallejo proposed. Let's swear. The others supported him. 
I told them that it was not necessary to take an oath for the time being, but that when the time came for them to become partisans, then they would take an oath. Now and without it every one must keep the party secret and give all his strength to the cause of the party. At this we parted. When the boys left and we were left alone with Vlado, he told me that he had tried to contact the Yugoslav partisans, but had failed, and asked for advice on how to proceed. I encouraged him and gave him the task of making another attempt in that direction as soon as possible. Such a connection could be very useful to both sides and was in full accordance with party instructions. Vlado accepted this assignment with great willingness. All the participants in the meeting went away filled with enthusiasm. Later the guys themselves told me about their experiences during and after the meeting. Mitko Granitov and his brother Atanas immediately moved their beds to the hayloft. There they made a hiding place for their weapons and clarified with their sister the password she would use to warn them in case the police came. Reiko from Bohova also moved his bed to the hayloft, but unlike Granitov he made a door in the back wall and attached a ladder to it, so that he could slip out unnoticed in case of danger. Vlado was not behind them either. He had a whole bag of ammunition, several hand grenades, and an old small caliber pistol. In other words, the boys were arming themselves, taking steps to become illegal, and this was a sign that preparations for the partisan struggle were in full swing. In Slizos we held a meeting with elderly communists. They were serious people. On all questions of international policy they fully agreed with the party's assessment and approved of its course. But when it came to the question of going illegal, they backtracked. We wouldn't mind, but where would we put the children? said Nikola Zakaryev. Hey, the children will stay at home. They will carry food to the mountains. Vado Marianov answered him. I did not react in any way, knowing from experience that the more you pay attention to such children, the more stupid things they say. This had an effect on the wayward girl, and she shut up. I didn't go to Lambos for a long time. Yakim had been arrested, who knew I was at his place and knew my alias, but he could not stand the torture and tell me where I was hiding. One evening, about two months after Yakim's arrest, I decided to stop by 82 Audrin Street. As I approached the front door, I noticed a suspicious, lanky man in glasses walking around in front of the house. Obviously an agent, I decided. So I made a sharp turn and crossed the street to the opposite sidewalk and walked in the opposite direction. I hadn't taken ten steps when I heard Pali shout, Boris, Boris, wait, I'll tell you something. I had to stop and wait for her. The suspicious subject continued to saunter by, pretending not to show any interest in us. Palia, too, paid no attention to him, and being very nimble, caught up with me in a flash. What's the matter? Why are you shouting? Can't you see who's hanging around you? I cut her off quietly but impressively. Palia was not embarrassed in the least. She was not familiar with embarrassment at all. It was important for her to tell me that the agents were looking for me at their place and she didn't notice that the agent was walking around under her nose. The apartment issue was not only a concern for us in Sofia. It was also very acute in the villages. As long as the weather was good, we could sleep in the open air. But when the snow fell, it became impossible to sleep in the forests, in barns and kosharas. However, the apartment issue for us was not an end in itself. It was connected with the involvement of new people in the struggle, with the increase of the army of the home front. Gradually I involved my father in our cause. The hardships of my illegal life broke his hard-heartedness. Now he took care of me not only when I was at home, but suffered and agonized over my every tardiness, tried to provide me with shelter with his acquaintances. Isaac Zakaryev from the village of Kostroshopsi became an assistant and confidant of the partisans thanks to my father, and he remained faithful and devoted to the partisan movement to the end. Of course, in front of outsiders, my father continued to speak ill of me and threatened that if he ever met me, he would be the first to put a bullet in me. This seemed natural, for even the chief of the Okoli police was aware of our conflict with my father, and we took advantage of it, just in case I dug a dugout not far from our house. I was helped by Nicola, my third brother, who, after returning from Sofia, immediately became involved in the work of the local group of the Union of Workers' Youth. Nikola was constantly going around the whole Okalia, going to Vlado Marianov, then to the secretary of the party organization in Slishopsi, then to Iosif Grigorov in the village of Leshnikopsi, hardening himself at illegal work. Through Toda Madenov, I contacted by Nedelko, brother of Krum Savov from Bresnik. 
He lived in an inn in the village of Barber, halfway between Tri and Bresnik, where he had a mechanical mill. Basha Nedelko had once been a social democrat, but under the influence of his daughters Helena and Natalia, he joined the Labour Party. During our first meeting, he gathered a few older comrades in whom he had confidence and formed a party group. By Nedelko was elected its secretary. Although he lacked one arm, he was characterised by exceptional efficiency. All day long he was lifting and removing sacks of flour at the mill, tinkering in the yard and figuring out which other people to involve in the resistance movement. Will you sell me some early potatoes? Angel Stoyanov from Mislov Stitsa could get as much flour as he needed at any time without paying a penny. One day our determined miller said to him, Why don't you go to the village of Rebro near Bresnik? I have a good friend there, a loyal man. I had no objections. We agreed on a second password, and a few days later I knocked on one of the outermost houses in the village of Rebro. It was at dawn. The man I came to had just woken up and was rubbing his sleepy eyes. His wife grumbled angrily. Hey, Stoyan, get up. Go and see who's asking for you. Who? Who needs me at the crack of dawn? By Stoyan grumbled, still stretching in bed. When I asked him about the price of the cow and calf he was supposedly going to sell, by Stoyan jumped out of bed. Everything became clear to him at once. From that day on, the house of Bai Stoyan, whose son was in prison for communist activities, became our base. We established the same bases in the Koshara of Bejako, Nedelko Savov's neighbour, and at Grandmother Lina's house in the village of Yarlopsi in Trine district. Grandmother Lina's sons, Vlado and Sando, both members of our party, offered me to go to their house at the first meeting, but I was grateful to them for that. Vlado was the eldest of the brothers, though only one year older. He had no education, and he was not good at speaking, but he was good at organisational work. The party group in Jarlov's already numbered more than ten people, but Vlado did not stop working to attract new members, regularly gathered the group, and with his characteristic persistence and confidence conducted propaganda work. Because of these qualities, Vlado was later promoted to the party position of being in charge of a sector that included six small villages in Znepol. The same sectors were entrusted to Jordan Nikolov, his brother Slavcho Nikolov, Asen Yordanov, and Vlado Marianov by distributing responsibilities in this way. This was done by the three of us, me, Jordan, and Slavcho Nikolov. We were able to facilitate party meetings to a great extent and to give party members an opportunity to report. In this way, we gradually strengthened party work strengthened party organizations. I remember once I spent the night in Grandmother Lena's cow shed. She came in the morning to milk the cows and saw a stranger. The old woman, she was 77 years old, was frightened. I noticed this and hurried to express my displeasure to her about her son Vlado, who told me to come here early to bargain for a calf, but he didn't come and made me waste my time. The old woman believed him and calmed down. He'll be here in a minute, she said. He's a bit slow. He's getting dressed. Well, all right, I said, pretending to calm down. I'll wait a little longer. Soon Vlado came. While Grandma Lina was standing beside us, we haggled about the calf. I deliberately gave a very low price. Vlado was asking for a high price so that the deal would not go through. And for the same purpose, I spoke unflatteringly about the calf. The old woman, who had been listening to our conversation with interest, became indignant and said angrily to her son, Listen, Vlado, send him away. Can't you see that he's making fun of our Haifa? Vlado explained to her that it was up to him. He wouldn't be cheap with the calf and advised her to leave. She obeyed him. We went straight into the barn. Vlado had not yet informed his mother of our secret. I expressed my fear that she might unwittingly speak out in the presence of some bad person. But Vlado assured me that whatever happened in their house, Grandma Lena would never share it with anyone. Don't worry. She won't tell a soul about our business. You see, she won't even say a bad word about the calf. Vado laughed good-naturedly, but I still felt uneasy. One winter day in 1942, without informing Vlado beforehand, I took refuge in his couch. It was warmer here, and the smell was not so unpleasant. I put straw in the trough and lay down, but as I knew that Grand Marlena might catch me here in the morning, I woke up very early to avoid being taken by surprise. But I'm still late. Have you come to sell chicks again? The old woman angrily called me from the doorstep. You are too stingy. We didn't find our heifer on the road. I wondered whether I should wait for Vlado and tell her the truth together, or whether I should do it myself. 
I was ashamed to fool a simple-minded old woman. I asked her to sit down and told her the truth. As I spoke, she looked me straight in the eye. Nothing in her face trembled, but I could see deep sympathy in her eyes, which were dried up, long ago weeping from various sorrows. Do you have a mother? I do. Oh, oh, what is your mother's heart, that she does not know where the night will find you, nor where the dawn will find you? It's hard for her, Grandma Lena, but she's made her peace with it. Many mothers suffer, not just my mother. Without it, there can't be our struggle. Grandma Lena was even more moved and cried. She cried with grief. She felt that the fate of her sons and her own would be no different from ours, that sooner or later the bitter fate would not pass her by. Em, come here, but beware of the workmen, she whispered with trembling lips. Damn those bloodsuckers who are after you. From then on I often took refuge in Grandma Lena's barn, and every time I went in there I heard her say, Damn them, those bloodsuckers. With these same words a little later, Grandma Lena crossed the threshold of Sophia's central prison. She was not spared a bit of fate. In the middle of November I returned to Sophia. Comrade Yakim approved everything I had done and ordered me to maintain regular communication with the Yugoslav partisans from now on. This was essentially a connection between the Sofia District Committee of the Bulgarian Workers' Party and the Vransk District Committee of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. I began to visit Sofia less and less often, not only because I had to travel a great distance, but also because it was becoming more and more difficult to hide in Sofia. The apartments of Milan Atanasov and Basil Petrov were no longer sufficient for our needs. We had to look for new like-minded people. Although Jews were subjected to barbaric persecution, Comrade Albert Kamhi readily provided me with his apartment, and later when the party called for strengthening the units, his son Peretz came to our unit with the first group. Near the county railroad in the area of the so-called second garage lived Georgi Rangelov, a construction worker. He was from the village of Mukovsai in Trianska Okokia and had long been a member of the party organization. Georgi Rangelov knew about my first trip to the Okolia and the second one. He also knew about my disagreements with Slav Shosetkov and behaved correctly when Comrade Jakim evaluated Sivetkov's behavior. Georgi had participated in the movement for a long time. He was a modest, inconspicuous, but devoted to the party. Knowing me from meetings at illegal meetings and conferences, Georgi, like Mancho and Lambo, gave me his apartment when I went underground, but I rarely used it because people alien to our movement lived near Bade George for other things. He collected money, arranged meetings with my comrades, both those who were legal and those who were underground. In other words, he helped me in any way he could. My two brothers-in-law, Vasil and Dikifor, were also good people. They lived at 41 Rishki Perival Street, in the Krasnaya Polyana neighborhood. By Nikifor had his own house, which absorbed all that he had managed to put aside for many years of tireless labor, and now he put aside a little every month from his miserable salary as a school servant to fix something in his cramped courtyard where, in addition to the two-room house with an entrance hall, a summer kitchen, a coal shed, a sheep shed and a tiny chicken coop were attached to each other. In this neighbourhood, all houses were built without a definite plan and without permission from the community authorities. Since the prices for land in Sofia were high, the new residents of the capital purchased building sites from a well-known swindler, whom everyone knew by the nickname Golden Pot, delivered the materials in rapid succession, gathered all the relatives and acquaintances, and erected the house overnight. Thus, the one-story house of Bainakiva appeared in the white light. All four of its inhabitants were fine people. When I stayed with them, they were most of all concerned about my safety and stood guard all day and night. At their place, I sometimes met with Bai Yakim and later with some of the leaders of the operational zone. Neither Vasil Theodosiev nor Bai Nikifor were party members. They were just honest people, understood where Bulgaria was going and sympathised with the patriots whom the fascist laws called enemies of the people and the state. Mazia was a fellow villager of mine. Tall, neatly trimmed, carefully shaved, he was always trim and tidy. Witty by nature, he could make people laugh, even when they were not laughing at all. By Nikifa was the same way, a funny man, a bully, a very sociable person. In this respect, they resembled each other like brothers. Vasil was a good master builder. He could do everything. He could build a wall, plaster it, and lay faience tiles. Whatever he undertook, he could do it all. That's why Vasil was never out of work. 
contractors were eager to hire him. Basil's father, grandfather Theodosius, was also a good master builder. A Democrat by conviction, he was not in words, but in deeds, in his attitude to people, he actively fought against the Sankovists in his village, exposed them, defended the interests of the workers, and thus won their sympathy. Vasil took from his father both his craft and his convictions. Later, when the working class party began to show itself more and more actively, he began to see even better and think even more correctly. It is clear to me, he told me once in a conversation, that the whole world is moving toward communism, and that the communists stand far above bourgeois democracy. This is what brought us closer to Vasil. And when I asked him for help, he said to me, There's nothing to persuade me. Come without any hesitation. At first only he and his wife, Raina, knew that I was an underground fighter. Then we revealed our cards to buy Nikifor and his wife, Mara. They were so involved in the conspiracy that they forgot about the house and themselves. They had become so used to me so interested in the party, its ideas and struggle, and so dear and close to me that if I was even a little late in arriving, they were very anxious to know whether anything bad had happened to me, whether the police had seized me, whether I had been killed, or whether I had died of hunger and cold. And when I did show up, they sighed with relief and tears of joy glistened in Raina's and Mara's eyes. That's how my friends treated me, and that's how everyone who helped the party treated me. They were all like family to me. They were happy when I came to them, cared for me and were sad for me when I was away for a long time, because together with our struggle their new hopes were born, and these hopes were more tangible when people saw me, because I embodied these hopes. The sisters, Raina and Mara, looked nothing alike. The younger, Raina was tall and thin, Mara was short and full. Raina had a white oblong face with cheerful, lively eyes, while Mara's face was swarthy and round and her gaze was calm. Raina was nervous, easily excitable. It was nothing to call her to a dispute or quarrel, and Mara was calm, compliant, and very, very cordial. On December 5, 1942, I spent the night at their house and, as usual, slept undressed in the small hallway on the couch. Through my sleep, I felt Mara shaking me hard by the shoulder and whispering excitedly. Nislavcho, son, there are military men all around in the street. Didn't they get wind of you? I was as good as dead from sleep. Slightly lifting the curtain on the window, I began to look. Everything was covered with a shell of ice. The glass, the branches of the trees, and the ground, near a neighbor's house, whose owners were somewhat shunned by my hiding place. I noticed armed soldiers. They moved in pairs in opposite directions, and peered into the yards. But whether they were looking for ladies of easy virtue or suspicious persons, it was difficult to guess. In any case, even the smallest disregard for danger would not be justified, especially since our combat groups had recently liquidated the famous executioner General Lukov, the Minister of War, because of which the fascists were particularly hardened. It's a raid, a wholesale search of the entire city. No one could leave the house. Police and troops everywhere. What to do? Where? How to hide? Sounded one after another questions in the house of Bai Nikifor. In the attic is not worth it. First, the neighbours will see, and secondly, if the police will start to search everything, there is still no place to hide. There's only one right place in our house, Rayner said. The shed. We had to act quickly and carefully. Rayner's suggestion received general approval, and we all went to the barn. Only Mayor A stayed in the hallway so that no one would accidentally enter the house. We set to work, and in a few minutes a grave-like hole was dug in the pile of coal. Now lie down, said by Nikifor. I lay down, stretched out my legs, pressed my hands to my body, and by Nikifa and Vasil first covered me with planks, then put large pieces of coal on them, and on top of everything threw indiscriminately various rags, gourds, onions, some dried yellow flowers taken off the walls. There was less danger now. Everyone calmed down a little. Vasil was the most cold-blooded all the time. He paced back and forth across the room and the yard, glanced at the barn door from time to time, and hummed a tune of his own composition. In the afternoon, Vasil told me that these soldiers were from the engineer battalion and that they were commanded by one of our mobilized fellow villagers. This further reassured everyone. Even if they were to search the place, our fellow villager would hardly want to harm us, I thought. At any rate, I hoped that the inspection would not be so thorough, and yet I continued to lie in my grave. Time flowed slowly in the cold barn. I began to freeze. 
First of all, my feet stiffened, and then the chill crept all over my body. My knees were no longer sensitive. The black stones pressed me so tightly that it was impossible to make the slightest movement, and I did not try to move, for fear of breaking the disguise. I had to be patient, silent, and not give in to the cold. At last a lively conversation was heard, first in the yard and soon in the room, from which the barn was separated by a rather thin wall. I heard everything. I recognised the voice of our fellow villager. The man did not linger long. Like an old friend, he joked with Vasil, Rainer gave him a cup and he left. I heard the heartfelt wishes of the women who saw him off and his courteous thanks in return. After him, the other soldiers did not visit us again, but I continued to lie in the coal pit until seven o'clock in the evening, when the radio announced that the raid was over. It did not, as it turned out later, produce the expected results, thanks to the fact that the people treated the communists with love, guarded and sheltered them skillfully. The police had mostly received persons who had not engaged in communist propaganda, but who were considered unreliable only because they had once said something against the government or cursed some of its representatives. This raid was a serious test, a test both for me and for my shelterers. They became even more prudent and became even more closely connected with our struggle, which was becoming more and more widespread. Karalem B. I. Zakhariev, the Lambo plasterer, also turned out to be a hospitable man. His apartment on Odrin Street, however, was one of the most inconvenient. Besides the fact that he had a lot of people living in his courtyard, and his sociable wife Palia received a lot of guests. His children Reina and Iljo were desperate to boys and could unwittingly give me away, especially Reina, the eldest, a very spoiled and willful girl. She was not easy to get along with. Once, in the presence of a strange woman who came to collect the insurance premiums from Haralambia, Reina, hurt by some remark of mine, instead of confirming that I was her father's cousin, as we had agreed to introduce me to strangers, or just keeping silent, so... Why are you lying? You are not my dad's cousin. One evening on the march, Sotir whispered to me that he was going to meet with Bulgarian Jews mobilized in the black company that worked on the train Kesura, Sodulika Highway. He offered me to go along with him. I readily accepted his offer. While we were walking to the meeting place, I was mentally going through my Jewish acquaintances. Here was Berto Kalo, the youth leader in the Banishaw neighborhood. The last time I saw him was when I was being taken to court. What happened to him? Maybe he's in some black company too, and I had a vague hope that maybe we would meet him here. An hour and a half or two hours later, we found ourselves near the Vlasinski swamp. I had heard all sorts of stories about it from my grandmother when I was still a child, and in my childish mind it looked huge, deep, and very treacherous. The Vlasinskoy swamp was also known in the history of wars. Many times hundreds of cavalrymen attacking the enemy suddenly drowned in it together with their horses and died ignominiously. Because of the darkness I could not see how wide it was nor how long it was. The weather was overcast and it could rain any minute. We had to hurry up with our work, because the next evening we were to be in another village and from there I was to be ferried back to Todorovsi. We stopped in front of a high stone fence. The double gates were firmly locked from the inside, so it was impossible to enter. We began to anger the dog, and soon a man's voice was heard from the yard. Mm, who is there teasing the dog? Yes, and open the gate and you will see, replied Sotir. The peasant opened the gate and cordially shook hands with the commander and then with me. Hey, have the Bulgarians come? Sotir asked in a whisper in Serbian. Not yet, the peasant answered in the same Serbian whisper. Then we will wait a little while, said Sotir, and went toward the streak of light falling from the open door of the hut. We sat down on low three-legged stools. Sotir began to ask the peasant something in Serbian, and the peasant answered him in Serbian. I only realized that it was about dinner. We were indeed hungry. We had eaten only a slice of oat bread and a piece of chalky dry cheese all day, so if the mustachioed peasant had offered us a bowl of chowder, we would not have refused. That evening the peasant treated us, and then I saw Carlo, of whom I had the best impression from our work together in Sofia. Just as we had finished supper, a dog barked again. It was clear that it was the comrades from the camp whom we had been waiting for. The peasant quickly jumped out of the house and immediately returned, leading three men. We said hello by the hand, but as the fire in the hearth was already burning out and there was no lamp, all those who had come seemed unfamiliar to me. 
It was only when the master threw some dry chips into the hearth and they burst into flames that lit up the whole shack that I recognized Kalo in the man standing in the corner behind the chimney. I rushed to him and embraced him. He jumped up, amazed and delighted at our meeting. Well, damn it, I never thought I'd meet you here. Where else but here? Satir intervened. I just didn't expect it, Kalo excused himself. I thought he was in Sophia. Sooner or later, everyone becomes a partisan. That's the way of all honest men, Satya added meaningfully. The conversation by the hearth lasted about an hour. We established an even more reliable connection with comrades from the Black Company, and at the end, Kalo handed over to Sotia various things collected by the Jews. Shrouds, sailcloth jackets, hiking boots, underwear, socks. From Kalo, we learned that there are about 200 people in the camp, but they are not yet ready to become partisans. Obviously, they hoped to be liberated soon and sent home. They could not foresee what the fascist authorities were preparing for them, nor did they realize that the struggle would become more and more aggravated. That same evening, Sotir distributed among the partisans the items they had received. This cheered and cheered them so much that they did not even notice the disgusting fine rain, which all the way slowly but surely tried to penetrate to our very bones. We spent the night in some kind of a barn. The building was two stories high. There were a few cows tied up downstairs, and the second floor was full of rye straw. There was a step ladder leading up to the outside wall of the barn. We could not see the rest of the details in the darkness. We could hear only the crunching of fodder on the cow's teeth and their heavy grunting, drowning out the measured sound of the rain. Wet but warm, all of us, with the exception of the sentry standing at the entrance to the barn, fell sound asleep. Some of us were so buried in the straw that only their heads were sticking out of it. I don't remember how long I slept. I only felt that I was sliding down somewhere, and suddenly I bumped into something. In my sleep I was frightened at first, and until I came to my senses and realized what had happened, I felt pretty bad. It should have happened that I, a guest of the couple, fell through the hole in the ceiling of the barn and fell into the feeder. It's a wonder I didn't hurt myself. I didn't have any pain. And the cows were frightened too. They got up and stamped their hooves. This attracted the attention not only of the sentry, but also of some of the gorillas sleeping next to me. Sotia woke up too. What happened? he asked. A Bulgarian fell into the stable, someone answered. Satir jumped up, attacked the partisan with whom he was talking about why he was doing nothing to get me out of there, and himself put his hand through the hole to help me climb up. Are you hurt? he inquired sympathetically. It was nothing. I answered, as I climbed out of the manger with his help and stretched out again on the straw. And then there was such a roar of laughter that I could not help myself and laughed with the rest of them. I laughed heartily, and I did not notice how I fell asleep again. It was time to part with the couple. Now I had only memories of them. When I set out, the partisans gave me ammunition and hand grenades. I stowed them carefully in my satchel. A week's stay in the partisan ten brought me great benefit. As a new partisan, I learned a lot of things here that I really needed when forming the unit and its first steps. I returned to Todoropsi accompanied by the same contact. The diligent fellow brought me to the exact day and hour. Smirjevich and his assistants had also arrived there. The party organized in honor of the anniversary of the October Socialist Revolution was in full swing. Recitations, songs, revolutionary sketches. Here I was completely disguised. The unremarkable teacher, on whom the girls cast only reserved and indifferent glances, immediately became the centre of attention. I had to do something in turn. This was the order established by the host, Jovo Rasik, in whose house all this was taking place. The poems of Botev and Smyonensky, which I had once learned by heart, came in handy, but those present were not satisfied with just reciting poems, but demanded songs as well. And although I am not a great singer, I submitted to the general will and sang the old Macedonian revolutionary song A Kolo Mama Kolo Mama's Rebel. It was because of this song that I began to be called Kolo here, and under this name I was known in this region almost until the end of 1943. The night passed very cheerfully. We danced good, sang partisan songs, recalled interesting stories. I spent the whole next day with Smajevic. Not at Rashik's place this time, but at Boris's, obviously a very trusted man of Smudjevic's. Boris was a bachelor in his forties, short, exceptionally amiable. The security of the house where we stayed was entrusted to the girls Savka, Dragica, 
Vera and Radko. They changed every two hours, depending on the work they were engaged in, and reported to Boris every slight change in the situation, while he leaned over to Smudgevich's ear in an emphasized familiarity and whispered to him. Vaso listened to him attentively and calmed him down, and he in turn calmed down the girls who were guarding us. From that day, we established regular communication with the Yugoslavs. On our side was assigned Vlado Marianov, and on the Yugoslav side was Jovo Rusik. As a sign of our future friendship and joint struggle, Vaso Smajevic gave me his Yugoslav made pistol. Now I was armed. When I was returning to Bulgaria, it was snowing. Rashic, who was escorting me, got lost in the thick gloom, and we walked at random. Nothing could help us in such a blizzard. And it was impossible to stand in one place, we could freeze, and the snow would carry us away, but it was difficult to go. On the plateau of Virtop, open on all sides, even stones could not resist the wind. We turned our backs to the wind and, driven by it, moved in an unknown direction. Suddenly we came upon a barn full of straw. We entered it, buried ourselves in the straw, slept, and at dawn. When the wind had died down, we oriented ourselves and moved on. Rashic accompanied me to the foot of the mountain, from where I could continue on my own, and we parted. It was a short walk to the village of Stretsmiropsi, where Vlado Marionov lived. I could now imagine that in our region, as in other parts of the country, the workers and peasants would rise at the call of the party, that work would boil up in our villages, and that through illegal channels new and new fighters would arrive in the Trine detachment. Closing my eyes, I saw a long column of partisans led by the best communists of the Okali. Jordan Nikolov, Georgi Grigorov, Arso Rashev, who had long ago sworn allegiance to the party, and following them a great number of boys and girls, their pupils and followers. The age of this elapidated hut was long, it seemed. It had known more than one generation of sheep herders and shepherds who had taken refuge in it, and now it served the revolutionary movement. In it, Smajevic received in one day alone dozens of liaisons who came from different parts of the Krenotrava district, some from the Chet, others from party organizations. He listened to them individually, and they returned to their homes, taking with them his little notes, which contained brief instructions regarding combat and political activities. The liaisons were mostly young men armed with carbines made by the factories in Krogujevak. They wore homespun breeches and rubber posts. Vaso detained only one of the liaisons. He was not even thirty years old. He was gaunt but strong, as if cast in iron. The partisan struggle needs just such men. Vaso said of him, wiry, sturdy, agile. I understood from the instructions my beach had given him in my presence that he would take me to the Sotia couple, a partisan commander widely known in this region both to the population and to the police. The liaison was from the village of Karne Trava and knew the whole neighborhood perfectly. We expected that my stay with this couple would last no more than a week, and that I would return to Todorovsi on the evening of November 7, when the anniversary of the great October Socialist Revolution would be celebrated. In that day, not only in the shepherd's hut, but also outside its walls, there was feverish activity. At a signal unusual for me, Milovan went into the forest and returned a short time later with a bundle from which he took out a tray with a meal of potatoes, rice and meat and a loaf of bread. We ate our lunch. Srechko suggested that I go into the forest. We found a path overgrown with grass and had just started walking along it when we met an elderly man on horseback. Srechko stopped him, said hello, and began to whisper something in his ear. I stood aside and waited for half an hour while they talked. As soon as the horseman was out of sight, we saw an old woman leading a little girl by the hand. Srechko stopped her too. The girl let go of the old woman's hand and started chasing birds, while I continued walking along the road and stopped a few steps away from her. Soon the old lady called out to the girl and they left. Of course, none of these encounters were accidental. They were arranged and there was no doubt that both the horseman and the old woman brought Smajewik's information concerning the police. The activities of overt and covert enemies, the mood of the population, and other things that interested the leaders of the resistance movement. In the evening, when the forests were bathed in the purple glow of the setting sun, and a pinching chill was again spreading through the valleys, I said goodbye to the three partisans and, together with my contact, set out on the road. We went straight through the forest. Judging by the sun, we were heading south. The forest was quiet, a real dead realm, 
Only occasionally a jay would fly from tree to tree and disappear into the thicket with a shrill cry. My guide was a trained man. He stepped like a cat, lightning fast and silently sliding through the bushes and slipping between them like a deer. I too was in a hurry, and was careful to pull back the branches trying not to lose sight of him, but I could not keep up with him, and he had to stop from time to time and wait for me on some knoll and then rush forward again, as if he had a precise time to the second when we should arrive at our destination. I was not yet accustomed to wading through dense bushes, but that I felt uneasy about stopping, for I did not know how far we had to go, nor the place. And secondly, my guide had his own plan, which was not to be disturbed by my fault. When I compared him with Smejevich and Rashich, he seemed to me very reserved, and even mysterious. He said nothing and asked me nothing. There was no occasion when he was even a little cheerful. Therefore I too felt awkward to ask him about anything, or to share my impressions of what I had seen in these places. Every man has his own character. I mentally excused my companion, and tried to ignore him. We descended into a deep ravine, at the bottom of which a stream was murmuring. The gloom enveloped everything around, and it gave mystery to the roiling water, which beat against the rocks, and to the sound of the wind, which, sliding down the bare precipitous slopes, merged with the noise of the foaming water, and turned into a monotonous hume. It seemed to be the sole ruler of these desolate places. Jumping from stone to stone, my companion quickly moved to the other side of the river and, without even turning around to see if I was following him, climbed up the rocky scree. I stopped for a second, looked at the river, and jumped boldly up the rocks. As I began to follow him upward, I felt water squelching in my shoes. He stopped, waited for me, and for the first time all the way up said, This is where we'll take a break. We still have a few hours to go to the place of lodging, and tomorrow at daylight we will go on. Now this guy suddenly became somehow sympathetic to me, and I justified him completely. Probably some special considerations made him hurry, keep silent and ignore me. The respite was indeed long, and we were able to gather our strength to continue our long trek. The road, too, became easier. One by one the meadows followed, clear and flat as the sky. Suddenly a bright moon shone above us rolling out from behind the dark mountains. Sheaves of its rays fell on the quiet, dark green expanses. The moon, too, seemed to be in a hurry and, swaying slightly on the invisible waves of the celestial ocean, proudly followed its long-established safe path. Are there many partisans in your region? Suddenly asked my companion. We have partisans, but they are still few. You will have many. We had few at first, too, he said, and was silent again. I was silent, too. In these moments I wanted to imagine our people's liberation army. I thought about the wisdom of Dimitrov and our party, about the difficulties of the beginning of the partisan struggle. Thus silently we continued on our way. At times we listened, looked around to see if anyone was following us, and again we walked and walked. There was a smell of smoke. Probably some settlement is close by, or perhaps the shepherds set fire to a tree somewhere during the day to keep warm and did not put it out, I thought. But as the guide showed exactly no interest, I stopped worrying too. Have you got a watch? he asked me. I do, I answered briefly. What time is it? Is it past midnight? I looked at the watch. Midnight had long since passed. We have arrived, said the guide. This is where our assistant lives in the valley. He walked carefully. We tiptoed down to the village. The house where we were supposed to stay stood at the very edge. There was no need to knock. The outer door was unlocked. Noiselessly we went inside. Several thick beech logs were burning in a large hearth. A pot full of potatoes hung over the hearth on a chain blackened with soot. The whitish smoke licked it from all sides and flowed in a thin stream, wriggling, into the narrow opening of the chimney. The woman was waiting for us, and judging from her carefully combed hair, she had not yet gone to bed. We had a supper of hot potatoes and lay down, but we hardly had to sleep for it was soon getting light and my guide wanted to leave before it was fully dawn. It was inconvenient to inquire, to show curiosity, but from the conversation between him and the woman I understood that she was the wife of a partisan, and that the Sotir couple had been in their village the previous evening. To the Sheeta we reached after sunset. During all that part of the journey we did not meet a single person. We were somewhere near Kamenik, a sparsely populated oblong mountain with rich pastures, where cattle and small horned cattle fattened up in the summer. Satir commanded only a dozen partisans. 
he had one light machine gun entrusted to the strongest and most agile partisan. The others had Kragwivka. The liaison first of all introduced me to the command. He was tall, broad-shouldered, looking no more than thirty or thirty-two years old. Ope built his couple, gave the command attention, shook my hand and introduced me to the soldiers. That same evening the couple blockaded one of the neighbouring villages and held a public meeting. At the meeting, where children were also present, Sotya spoke about the situation in Yugoslavia, about the struggle of their people against fascism, about the aims of this struggle, and mentioned that in Bulgaria too a partisan movement was developing, and that one such Bulgarian was among them. This message greatly interested the peasants, and I noticed how many stretched out their heads to see me. Now you will see him, said Sotia, and invited me to say a few words. This was a surprise to me, and I was at first embarrassed, but I got over myself immediately. Yugoslav peasants well met my message about the torch factories and derailed trains, about the partisan cheaters operating in our country, about the strong resistance that gives the Bulgarian people to the fascist government, about his determination to fight together with all peoples against fascism. The peasants unanimously supported the slogan of joint struggle against the common enemy and protested against the arbitrary actions of the Bulgarian police on Yugoslav territory. My speech, in Sotia's estimation, had good results. Before the end of my stay in the honour, I spoke several more times at meetings between partisans and peasants. This was the first step toward our future joint struggle, which the Bulgarian and Yugoslav partisans waged until complete victory. Oh, Slavo! Mare, Vlado's sister, had just returned from the field and was drying her wet stockings by the fire, frowning, angry at the bad weather and at life itself. Whatever power comes, some people will live well and others will be poor. You, if you survive, will become important figures. You will get a big slice of the pie. And those who are afraid to help you now will settle down too, while Mara will continue to walk around like a gypsy. You may think I'm uneducated and don't understand anything, but God willing, we'll live to see who's right. I've had more than once to talk to Mara on this subject, to convince her that our government will be fair in the distribution of benefits, that everyone will receive in accordance with what he deserved in this struggle, that the purpose of our struggle is not to get high positions, but to overthrow fascism and provide the people with freedom and independence. But Mara only waved her hand at all my arguments. Because of her failed personal life, Mara had lost all hope for something good and just. She had only one wish, to get married, and this is not an easy thing in our district for a girl. Young guys went to earn money in other regions. There they got a family and our girls were getting old. That's why Mara saw everything in a black light. At first glance it might seem that Mara is alien to our struggle in general, that she sees only material benefits, but in reality it was not so. She had a difficult, gloomy character. She liked to argue with us sometimes, she deliberately spoke against us, and she herself helped us in the realisation of our ideals. And later she herself was imprisoned for the same ideals. Around midnight Vlado took us out of the village. There we parted. He returned home, and Javo Rasik and I went to Mount Vartop. At that time there was a lot of talk about the partisan movement in Yugoslavia, but I didn't know the extent of it. I didn't know how many units there were, nor what their numerical composition was. But I rejoiced, because our neighbour Yugoslavia, as well as Bulgaria, fought for freedom and independence. And how much blood the Bulgarian people shed, how many sacrifices they suffered in this struggle. To fight for their freedom and independence became for them, we can say, a common thing. The exploits of the Hajduk during the Turkish yoke, the actions of the insurgent groups, the violent uprisings for national liberation, then the September uprising of 1923, organised and led by our party, in which dozens of partisan chetas and detachments fought for the overthrow of the reactionary bourgeois that had seized power, all this constituted a precious heritage for the party, a source of pride for every Bulgarian patriot. And if what I read about in books and learned from the stories of contemporaries of those events was something distant, unfamiliar to me, then everything that happened in the summer of 1942 was close, familiar and understandable to me. Even in Sofia, in the canteen on Histobotev Boulevard, where I was eating, in the streets, in cafes and other places, I heard conversations about parties and groups, cheetahs and detachments operating in many parts of the country. Much was said about the Shetas operating in the Razlov and Dupnik districts, about the Sila cheetahs in the eastern part of the Middle Mountains, 
about two cheetahs in the Panagia district, about the cheetahs operating in the area of Sopot, Karlovo, Kazanlak, Stara Zagora, Pazarchik, Lov, Troyan, Slevin, Yambul, Vidin, Gabrov, Sevlev, Omertig. Probably the total number of all the Shetan detachments had already reached several dozen. There was almost not a single district where some partisan unit was not operating. All this lifted my spirits, and I thought that I would come to the Yugoslav partisans with my head held high. The Bulgarian Communist Party mobilized and put thousands of its members and members of the Union of Workers' Youth in combat ranks. So we have our own considerable experience of partisan struggle. And since the joint struggle against the common enemy required the exchange of experience, coordinated actions and mutual assistance, my goal was to contact the Yugoslav partisans. That was how I understood my task, and that was what I strived for during all my meetings with the Yugoslav partisans and their leaders. In the beginning, the road was steep and difficult. The higher we climbed, the more effort we had to expend. I was bending under the weight of a 10 kilogram satchel, but concentrating on overcoming the difficult path. I did not notice how we climbed a steep slope and suddenly found ourselves on a spacious clearing, a mountain plateau. In front of us, far to the north and west, the outlines of the snowy mountains of Serbia sizzled in the pre-morning gloom. From time to time, Rasik stopped, smiled contentedly at something, loudly sang a partisan song, the glades picked it up, passed it to the hills, and the song flew forward, just where Rasik was walking quickly and confidently. The golden disk of the sun slowly broke through the grey streaks of fog that covered the horizon. Its rays, drilling through the dense blanket, crept across the valleys and hills, chasing away the November morning chill, touched the cooled earth, warmed it with its heat, and it softened, emitting a light pale vapour. The dark cloak of clouds lifted above Zimpole, and immediately under it the reddish roofs of the villages, awakened from a deep sleep, fled from the valley and laid down at the crest of the mountains. The grass warmed by the sun also revived. The ice crystals that had frozen on the leaves overnight cried, dropping small tears. Over there, Rashik pointed to the northwest. There lies our village, the heroic village of Karne Trava. We say, Karne Trava, Burkina Powers, Rashik said proudly. He paused for a moment, twirled the tips of his moustache with his fingers, and a smile blossomed on his face, revealing two rows of teeth as white as snow. My companion was in a surprisingly good mood that day. He spoke fascinatingly about the guerrillas, about their fighting, about the commander of the Biki O.K., who was in the vicinity of Kiane Trava. He also spoke about the difficult life of the Yugoslav population and about the prospects of the liberation struggle. All this fueled my impatience, increased my curiosity, gave rise to new questions to which I waited for answers, and although we had been on the road for several hours, I did not feel tired. At last we crossed the plateau and began to descend. The frost-whitened glade was behind us. Now we were walking along a road cut by the beds of dried-up rivulets. A few pairs of oxen were wandering slowly ahead. If they ask you who you are and where you are going, tell them that you have been appointed teacher in the village of Broad and that you caught up with me on the road, Rashich warned me. Between good people there are bad ones, and our business requires strict observance of conspiracy. When we had caught up with the wagon, they were lumberjacks. We passed them and approached the Tador of Simahala, Rashik sang. It was a conventional sign by which Rashik told the guards of his village that everything was in order, and at the same time received a signal from the guards that the way was open. In the evening there was a gathering at Rashik's house. Many girls came, of whom I remember sisters Savka and Dragica, little Vera, Nadia from Popova Mahala, and some others. There were no boys. They had gone to the partisans. At first Rashik introduced me as a teacher who had come to take office, and I had to play this role in such a way that no one would have a shadow of doubt. But when three guerrillas came to the party and we were alone with them, it was probably clear to everyone what this teacher wanted. We left the party around midnight. There was usual silence in the mahal. All the windows were dark, a precautionary measure in case the police, who occupied the best building in the centre of the village, came. There was a guard in the mahal around the clock. This service was performed by girls. In case of danger, they notified the responsible comrade from the party group or organization, and the latter, for his part, decided whether to offer armed resistance or to take the people into the forest. Two partisans were dressed almost identically. Breeches, half-coats, high shoes with horseshoes and pilots, 
Two had rifles, and the third had a pistol and two small egg-shaped grenades on his belt. The one with the gun, tall, black-haired, black-browed, with a smooth-shaven face, introduced himself as Vaso Smajevic. He was Serbian. Having graduated from the Faculty of Law in Belgrade, Smajevic had gone underground from the first days of the German occupation and then joined the armed struggle. He was now secretary of the Vranje District Committee of the Yugoslav Communist Party and was responsible for the activities of the party organization of the Kronotrava district, where, compared to neighboring districts, the partisan movement was the most developed. The other comrades were younger than Smajevic. Milovan was in charge of the Communist Youth Union of Yugoslavia and Sreko, as a local, guarded them and was their guide. He was proud of the fact that he was from Sione Trava and knew many guys from our villages. We stayed up all night. It was spent in conversation, during which we asked each other questions, shared information and thoughts about foreign and domestic political events. They wanted to know more about the situation in Bulgaria. I wanted to know more about the situation in Yugoslavia. The Germans had occupied Bulgaria without a declaration of war. They came to us with the consent of the government of Tsar Boris and tried in every way to make themselves look like friends of the Bulgarian people. The Bulgarian fascists associated this occupation with the creation of a greater Bulgaria in which the Germans were given a primary role. In this situation, the Tsarist army remained intact. It represented the main armed force of the fascist power, and it was entrusted with the task of persecuting the partisans and strangling the liberation struggle. This circumstance greatly complicated the work of the party because the decomposition of the army and its transition to the side of the people required not only a lot of effort, but also a lot of time. A serious obstacle to the rapid expansion of the armed struggle was the lack of weapons. Party figures, having gone underground, had to collect a cartridge each, a rifle and a pistol, often rusty and of a pre-fashionable type. It was impossible in one night neither to analyse everything in order to penetrate deeply into all the issues at the centre of attention of both brotherly peoples, Bulgarian and Yugoslav, nor to foresee all the details pertaining to our joint actions. We intended to meet and discuss these issues many more times. There were many days ahead of us and time was working for us. From Todorovsi we moved to Popova Mahala. It is difficult for me now to describe the places through which Sretko led us. How many times we slid down, how many times we fell, how the bridge over the Konotrava River broke under us and how we, soaked to the skin, gnashed our teeth against the cold until we reached the house of the cheerful girl Nadia. The adventures that accompanied our journey did not make much impression on me because all my attention was absorbed by the forthcoming meeting with one of the Konotrava detachment. I kept thinking about how the partisans looked like, how they were armed, how long and intense their battles were, what their ties with the people were. Dawn found the four of us in a small clearing, above which several old mossy beech trees crossed their bare branches. Everything was white from the frost that had fallen during the night. The grass, the trees, the little dilapidated hut that lurked at the lower edge of the clearing, and the tall, dry weeds around it. The smallest one, Vasilka, had velvet eyes and rosy cheeks. Her look and smile were inexpressibly captivating, and all this childish charm and innocence could have been lost because of me. This is the inexorable logic of struggle, the logic that the heart and mind refuse to accept, a constant source of internal conflicts. At that time, the only industrial enterprise in Trenska Okolia was the Zlater mine, which was developed by English capitalists. About 200 people worked hard to earn their daily bread. It was necessary to establish contact with these people, to organize them so that they could defend their interests. It was necessary to go to the Pymas with someone who would know both the people and the enterprise. The most suitable person for this was Asen, but seeing how weak and exhausted he was, and how chromatic he was, I did not dare to ask him to accompany me. Yet, as much as I pitied him, I had no other choice, so I had to turn to him. I will take you, he answered without hesitation. Ed, and how could I talk to Angel Stoyanov from Mislovshitsa? He is a farmer, as I knew him in my gymnasium years, but our task is to attract to the patriotic front also figures of other parties. We'll invite him here. Isn't it dangerous for him to see me in your house? I think not. I know him as a decent man. But even if it is, if you have to, you have to take risk. Reason's answers were always decisive, because none of his relatives ever interfered with him. His father, grandfather Jordan, 
grazed oxen near the village and watched the surroundings. His grandmother, Marika, grazed sheep, and his wife, daughter, while cooking, made sure that no neighbours entered by accident. Pavlina, though still small, also did her duty. She passed short notes to the secretary of the Okolian committee, Arso Reshev, with whom the Yordanovs were related, and collected data on the number and intentions of the police. The meeting with Angel Stoyanov and some other comrades from the mine took place in the mining village. Here, in a semi-dark room among those gathered, I saw a dressmaker named Stefka, an acquaintance of mine from Sofia. Her husband worked as a technician at the mine. He was an anarchist in his beliefs, which was the reason for their constant arguments. The meeting took place in Stefka's apartment, but her husband was not present. He had gone to a neighbouring village on some business. The meeting was attended by comrades from the mine, Angel Stoyanov and his fellow villager Vlado Madenov. We formalised the fatherland front group and, in order to finish before Stefka's husband returned, we hastily reviewed some party documents. Letting Ersen go, I went with Angel Stoyanov to see him in Mislovstitsa. At first I tried to talk to him as a person belonging to a different party, and began to convince him that our ideological differences could not be an obstacle to participation in the struggle for a common goal. The overthrow of fascism, but Angel immediately told me that he had long ago realised his error and had joined the communists. To call him a farmer when he himself considers himself a communist was unwise and even harmful, and I talked to him further as a like-minded person. That same evening he led me to his house. We stopped there for a moment. He showed me a room where I could stay, and we immediately parted. From that day on he associated himself, his family, and his old man's father, Stojan Cassinu's grandfather. Some time passed, and I actually had to go in to see them. Not a single door in the house was locked, not even in the bedroom, and their dog, as Grandfather Stoyan said, was born on the Annunciation and therefore never barked at me. Mila, Angel's wife, was a teacher in the same village. When she was at school, little Evo, their only son, stayed with his grandfather. Grandmother was away. Mila was always kind, always tried to keep a good mood and did not share with any of the neighbours what was going on in their house. Angel's father, Grand Pastoyan, had already passed sixty, but his cheerful appearance, ruddy face and confident gait said that he still had powder in the powder keg. He was an old member of the Agricultural People's Union, belonging to its left wing, but he always found common ground with the communists. His sons, Angel and Velin, who worked in the Pernick mine, did not follow his petty bourgeois ideology. They were ahead in their thinking and outlook on life. But Grandfather Stoyan was not angry with them. He was pleased that Angel had become the director of the progymnasium in their native village, and Velin was also growing in his profession and enjoying good fame among his comrades. Both Angel and Velin were like their father, especially Angel. He, too, had a large face, a stocky figure, and a stoic gait. Even on my first visit, Grandfather Stoyan had taken an interest in me. My coming at night, staying all day in a locked room and leaving the house at night, caused the old man considerable concern. Listen, Angel, where is this guy from? He's a colleague of mine, Angel said. He is returning from his native village and is going to ship Kovica. He'll be a teacher there. Although the answer did not satisfy him, the old man remained silent. He reconciled, but not for long. As soon as I showed up a second time, he realised what I was doing and finally calmed down. One day, when only the three of us were left in the room, Grandfather Stoyan turned to his son. Angel, do I really know nothing and don't understand anything? Why don't you tell me what's going on in the house? After all, I am the boss. Boris is not a teacher, his work is rather strange. And if you have any respect for me, tell me the truth, so that I may be able to help you. With the old man's insight and willingness to help us, it was unnecessary to keep him in the dark, so we told him the whole truth. He breathed a sigh of relief and said, What troubled times we have lived in. The actions of the Yugoslav partisans and the acts of sabotage carried out throughout the country by the Bulgarian partisans found a deep response among the youth of our region. All this increased their enthusiasm, inspired them, aroused their fighting impulses, gave rise to an all-powerful sense of duty to their people, whose freedom and independence were so mercilessly violated. The youth of Trin followed with interest the actions of the Yugoslav partisans along our western border and made repeated attempts to contact them in order to fight together against fascism. The Yugoslav partisans, in turn, sought the same contact, 
they sent their men to our villages. Under the guise of workers, threshers or traders, buyers of cattle and other goods, they ascertained the situation, collected the necessary information about the mood of the population and about the movement of police and troops. Such a person was Jovo Rasik from the village of Kearne Trava, who travelled through the villages of the Okulja under the guise of a cattle dealer. He was contacted by Vlado Marianov, who had been entrusted with this task. I met Rasik at Vlado's place. Vlado and his older sister Mara lived with their mother, Sakai's old, dry, mackerel-like grandmother, the head of the orphaned family. Vlado's house stood at the edge of the village, where the Irma, which had dried up quite a bit during the summer, flowed and along which the vegetable gardens stretched. The darkness concealed my arrival. In Vlado's yard the little dog snarled, but, apparently, only to show that he had noticed me, but he was too lazy to get up from the heated bed. The entrance to the house was clearly visible in the light that fell on the cobblestones from a small square window cut in the door. I walked along the light streak, raising the collar of my duffel coat high so that I would not be noticed by the curious eyes of the neighbours. I had been looking forward to meeting Rashich for a long time. That's probably why it was so cordial. Strong handshakes and hugs expressed our mutual affection and trust. Even Tucker's stern grandmother, who was present, did not reproach us for being too sensitive. Rashich was tall, with quick, lively eyes and thin brown moustache, neat, trim and cheerful. He looked no more than thirty, a time when men are especially youthful and active. Saka's grandmother sat next to us. Her life was restless, anxious and joyless. Poverty and caring for her five children had long ago put the stamp of old age on her. Her face was covered with deep wrinkles, her hair was white and veins were swollen on her arms. The old woman worked incessantly. If she was not knitting, she was mending. If she was not mending, she was spinning. Her hands never knew a moment's rest. And now, on top of everything else, Grandmother Saka was suffering for Vlado. He was her youngest, but she had the highest hopes for him. The rest of her sons had scattered like fledglings, and they rarely saw each other. So now Grandmother adored Vlado, and his mother was worried for good reason. Vlado took up every task with fervor, gave it his all. Then Rasik, Vlado, and I left Grandpa Tisaka alone, and went to another room for a while to exchange ideas about my meeting with the partisans of one of the neighbouring units, commanded by a certain book. When we returned to Grandmother Saka's room, she was still sitting in front of the flickering kerosene lamp, pulling and pulling a long thread out of the yellowish hemp hedge, which would later be used to weave cloth for shirts for herself and her children. The eyes of the long-suffering woman were moist and two large tears froze under each of them in a deep wrinkle, as if waiting. They absorbed the faint light and reflected it like transparent crystals on ancient jewellery carefully stored at the bottom of a chest. Nurse Laveau, she said to me, apparently not without hesitation. You are ruining my son. He was my only hope, but I see that I will have to be a homeless orphan in my old age. Tears streamed down the deep wrinkles and dripped onto the worn lithac. Don't be afraid, Granny Tokar. We are old men. We will beware. Hmm. Can't I see you beware? Come at night, the neighbours' dogs bark, the gate creaks, the neighbours see everything. Where will I go if the authorities burn down my house? Baba Tokar's words were justified. They echoed in our hearts with pain. But what could we do to comfort her? After all, all mothers have the same feelings, the same desires and the same sufferings. And if a person does not overcome himself, does not overcome his own suffering and anguish, he will not become a fighter for the people. He becomes one only when the high consciousness of the nation's grief, suffering and misery, the consciousness of the importance of the struggle for the interests of the working class, and the whole nation takes precedence over his own suffering and grief. That is why we try to console Grandmother Sakar that life cannot be changed without struggle that she too will have a good real human life when the causes that have crippled her so far are removed, when all the wealth is taken away from the rich and a truly people's power is established. Grandmother Tike agreed with us, but her mother's troubled heart would not rest. Sighing, what you do at least do it with reason. As soon as we were a few hundred meters away from the fire, we heard gunshots, screams and women's cries. Help, help, we're on fire. Parting with Reiko. We instructed him to strictly carry out our instructions and, regardless of the circumstances, to keep our arrival a complete secret. Raiko complied. He had to serve time in police custody and his father had to pay a lot of money to get him out of there, 
but the participants in this action remained undiscovered. We set off on the return trip to Sofia. We were elated with our successes, and we were in a hurry to boast of them. What would our party leader say now? If it had been by Andre, he would certainly have smiled, patted us on the shoulder, and said, Well done, guys, act even more courageously. But how would the new man, in front of whom I've always felt a certain shyness, evaluate our work? What if he squinted his greenish eyes, furrowed his brow, and said, Ironic? Haven't you thought of anything more useful than setting fire to people's haystacks? What use is that to the party? To such an ironic question, I was ready to object. These are our first experiments. If they are unsuccessful, we will try something else in the spirit of the party line. On the way to Sofia between me and Tetsvetkov, there was a spat. Obviously, we did not agree not only in character, but also on a number of fundamental issues we had different opinions. And yet neither of us did not compromise anything. Continuous disputes somewhat complicated our relations, and as I assumed, Setkov, it turns out, did it deliberately. He simply did not want to return again to the cases that we had to perform. We returned to Bresnik. Bailazo met us visibly agitated. Run, he said. Some parachutists have descended near the town, and now everything around is blocked by troops and police. Tonight and tomorrow they will search all the houses and kosharas in a row. Run quickly before you're captured. Bailazo was a serious man. We could not disbelieve him and, without a moment's hesitation, rushed to run along our old path, which led to the other side of Birido. In no time we found ourselves on the highest part of it. In the darkness it was difficult to distinguish pine trees from thorny hawthorns and blackthorns, and as we made our way through the forest we scratched ourselves. Our hands and face were bleeding, and our sleeves were torn in several places. We looked around no police or troops. Maybe they're on the other side, we decided and cautiously continued on our way, trudging through the deep valley, waiting for dawn to break soon. The valley led us into spacious meadows yellowed by drought. To the south of the meadows, the highway Bresnik. Bitanovtsi, Sofia, was white. Here it is, the police. Ma suddenly said Tetskov and pointed to the silhouette of a man in the roadside ditch, who was leaning and straightening up. We began to look closely, even waited a little, until better dawn. When we were able to see the silhouette, we saw that it was a woman. We approached her. She was an old gypsy woman who had started early in the morning. She was fetching water in a large wooden bucket. She turned out to be a neighbour of Bailazo and had come from the city. The woman was crossing the bridge, and if there really had been a blockade, she would certainly have met a patrol there, but she saw no one. From everything it looked like either Bailazo had been misled by someone or was simply afraid. The time for the meeting with Yakim was approaching. I had a premonition that he would reprimand me for returning so soon, but I still thought that a report of the work done would soften him, and that I would promise to leave Sophia again soon. To my surprise, Comrade Yakim made no remark to me, and regarding the action said exactly what I had expect. One should not be carried away by such arson. It is always necessary to achieve a political effect, and from such actions the political effect is not in our favour. Strengthen your work on the creation of fatherland front committees in the field. Expand ties with the people. Expose every step of the fascists. Collect weapons. And advised me to get my own weapons. Since there are no guns, you have to kill a German soldier or a Bulgarian policeman and take his gun, he said, and that is not so easy. I understood all these difficulties and did not expect to get a weapon from the organisation. However, the task of finding a weapon came before me with all seriousness. It was dangerous without weapons. If I could get at least a gun, it was time to return to Trinska Okoya. This time Comrade Yakim warned us categorically that we should stay there longer, not to hurry back to Sofia. When I left the capital, Tetsvetkov refused to accompany me, saying that he would get there himself and meet me at the well where we met the peasant woman and Natso's grandfather. But I waited for him there in vain. He did not show up at the appointed time or later. It was much more pleasant to stay in Sofia than to wander at night on and off the roads, in rain and cold, soaked, often hungry, and feeling the danger constantly hanging over you, especially as Chizetkov had no obstacles to legal existence. From that day I was left all alone, moving only at night, not using any means of transportation, neither train nor horses. On the instructions of Comrade Yakim, 
Slapcho Tevtvetkov was exposed for cowardice and completely stripped of his trust. My new position, without a comrade, had both its positive and its negative sides. A lonely man is always exposed to a great risk. Even wolves can ignore him and no one will see it. But on the other hand, his movement is much easier and there are more opportunities to hide. So passed for me the whole fall of 1942 and most of the winter, including February, when the first partisans began to arrive. August, September and October were a time of recovery, revitalization and strengthening of the party organizations. During this time I was able to expand my contacts in Brishia Kokolia by contacting comrade Tudor Emelinov from the village of Jaroslavsi and several young men from the village of Konska, as well as comrade Alexander Tinkov from Bresnik. I was able to pull threads to other villages in the Okolia. I established contact with two members of the underground leadership of the RMs in the gymnasium, in Trinsky, Jusif Grigorov and Mitko Kirov. Thanks to them, the work among the students also intensified. A group of the Union of Working Youth appeared in every class and began to operate. I also contacted Comrade Yordan Nikolov, with whom we clarified some questions concerning the structure of the party and youth organizations in Okoli, identified those responsible for the state of the organizations in the individual districts, and discussed with him how we would keep in touch with the Okoli party leadership. I attended the first meetings of communists in the villages. We collected hundreds of kilograms of apples, corn, potatoes, beans, and other products, while the youth carried out an action of sabotage on the telephone and telegraph line and thus disrupted the normal life of the fascist administration. The boys were getting weapons assiduously, and at the sit-ins the girls wrote to their brothers in the barracks not to shoot at the partisans, but to turn their guns against their commanders, who were servants of the car and the bourgeoisie. The meetings took place with great precision. The comrades appeared enthusiastic and excited, and the meetings usually took place at night outside the village. Between the party members and the members of the Workers' Youth Union, there arose cordial relations, mutual trust and affection. Party secrecy was strictly guarded, and I now had many more opportunities to take refuge. I also saw Todor Stoichev from the village of Zabel. He continued to grind grain for the poor in his mill, and at the first meeting he gave 20,000 livres in favour of our movement. In addition, I agreed with him on the password with which our helpers in the villages would come to him to get flour for the partisans, which he would give them free of charge. Raiko Nikolov was already free. My sister Nadia and her husband Bon were also freed. At the same time, comrade Yakim summoned Jordan Nikolov to Sofia and confirmed to him the tasks set before me. He also warned him and the rest of the leadership that they were obliged to assist me and to take serious measures against possible arrest. In case of danger, comrade Yakim emphasized, go underground immediately. From that time on, I began to live with the thought that I would soon have new, battle-tested friends, underground fighters. A peasant woman with whom we talked at the well, a woman who had experienced and seen a lot in her life, unwittingly suggested to us that her husband could be useful to our cause and he really turned out to be a man of no accident. Asen Yordanov was a devoted participant of the communist movement. Since childhood he had mastered the tailor's craft, and his character was modest and selfless. He was the first to open the door of his house to us. Limp-footed, he arranged meetings for me, accepting the responsibility and risk of being our assistant without asking who we were, what we were and where we were from. It was enough for him to know that the party had sent he linked his love for his children with his love for the people and the party, and in the name of this love he gave up his bed and, while I rested, guarded me, gave me his far from thick scrap of bread, because he felt it was right. This is how this quiet man, a modest communist who was ready to sacrifice himself, his children, and his elderly parents for the cause of the party, understood his duty. To his family he said, The most important thing is to keep a secret. If we give ourselves away in any way, over the end. One must keep one's mouth shut and think who one is talking to and what one is saying. Jason's children, Pavina, Mitko and Vasilka, whenever I came to them, saw me, even stayed with me in the room, but well-mannered and disciplined, were not surprised, did not ask who he was, this stranger, and why he came. Sometimes we solved problems with Pavlina and Mitko, or I checked their lessons. They took it seriously and listened to me. Mitko was in the first grade of elementary school, Pavlina was in the second grade of gymnasium, and Vasilka was in his fifth year. Their mother, clean and neat, 
blew the dust off her children. But at the same time she taught them to keep clean and respect labour. Hmm. Carefree soul. What's it to you? The sea is up to you. Nicola's brother got angry and, tearing his hat off his head in anger, threw it on the grass. If I were a single man, I would also think like you. Oh, you're talking nonsense, Vlado. Added Buby, one of the neighbours of the Zakaria brothers, and looked around to see how his words would be received. The others loudly expressed their approval, but then somehow guiltily fell silent, feeling apparently embarrassed. This was the end of the first illegal party meeting of the Slesov communists. It was obvious from everything that in Slesov Sea would face serious opposition to the fulfilment of party directives. The family shackled the determination and loyalty of the communists as soon as there was talk of leaving home and going illegal. To this I drew the attention of Vlado Marianov, who was to lead the group and account for its activities. Hey, if they don't agree to anything else, they can dig dug dugouts, he said confidently. Hey, that they will do it, I do not doubt. But dugouts are not the most important thing now. You mean to say that the dugouts will be needed when there are people, Vlado remarked. Yes, but people are the hardest to deal with. You see how they reason. Now they don't despair. If they don't move, it's all right, we're ready, said Vlado. In your readiness, we do not doubt, said Svetkov, but it is not enough. Here I remembered the wise words that I once heard from my grandfather. Serious business in a hurry do not do. Everything needs an approach, skill. They will come, they will come, I thought. Our struggle is like a storm. A whirlwind will blow up and take with it everything that meets on its way. The parting with Vlado was touching. He almost wept and already lived with the hope that every Wednesday around midnight he would be able to meet us at the Rijanowska mill. For this purpose we had made arrangements for signalling. As I've already mentioned, my elder sister lived in Slizos. When I met her I wanted to see my whole family, especially my mother. She had suffered so much in her life, you could hardly find a single day in her life that was happily lived with my father. If there was no money, it was her fault. If one of the villagers made him angry, he took his anger out on her. Once my elder brother Basil lost a newly born goat in the mountains. When he brought the herd, my father was not at home. He arrived in the middle of the night, and as soon as he entered the room, he asked my mother about the baby goat. He is lost, she said half asleep. The father, not knowing how it had happened, whether his brother was to blame or not, exploded like a bomb, and raised such a shout, such a scolding, that he woke up all the little ones. Oh, go and find him now, go now, and don't come home without the baby goat? Of course we did not and could not find the goat in the huge dense forest, but how much time my father ate my brother and mother for this, it cannot be measured. Sometimes he would come into the house drunk, he would go into a kind of frenzy, and none of us dared to let him see him. He would rage like the Janissaries in the old days. He would plant the window frames in the room and leave my mother freezing in the cold winter nights, or he would kick her out of the house, and she would have to spend the night with the cattle in the stable or go to the neighbours his horse. Such a bleak life was hers and ours until we grew up. When I entered the gymnasium I felt already independent and began to give my father a rebuff, to protect my mother and did not allow him to abuse her. Her bitter fate tied me to her even more, and I had a great desire to see her. She, in turn, was saddened by my absence and longed for me. But it was not so easy to do so. I did not want to meet my father in any way. He was not to know that I was at home. I didn't fear that he would betray me. I was just weighed down by his advice to abandon communist ideas. He and I had always been on opposite sides. A former radical, he fully supported the current regime, calling the communists either freeloaders or fantasists. But he himself preferred not to work, but to sit down in a cool tavern and sip shot after shot of the strongest plum or tart wine. My relations with him especially deteriorated in 1933, after my expulsion from the gymnasium, he said to me with ang. Give up this damned communism. Don't you see that you don't belong there? There are special people for this class. You'll get to the point where they'll burn down my house but you'll be in a lot of trouble yourself. You'll have a lot of grief. There has never been equality between men and there never will be. The Trinian authorities knew of our quarrels. They also knew that my father hated me, his son, because of my communist views, and this was an obstacle to my coming home to see my mother. 
my grandmother, my kindly grandfather, who was a Russophile, and in all other respects the complete opposite of my father, to meet my brother Pesho, my reliable assistant in my forthcoming illegal work. Our conversations with the youth and older communists in the Bresnik and Trinsk districts were generally encouraging. Of course, this was only the very first step. Many difficulties lay ahead, but their nature was already clear to me. Although Slavcho, Sidkov and I had no weapons, we decided to undertake two small actions on the way to Bohova, to set fire to the haystacks of the supporters of the fascist power. One was from Setkov's village and the other from my village. After the first action in the village of Ranaluk, we were supposed to go to Bohova, but it ended in such a shameful escape as I had never seen before. Slavcho got cold feet. As soon as he saw the flames, he gave such a gallop that I could hardly keep up with him, and then he dragged me into some swamp in the Ranaluk field from which we, soaked to the waist, could hardly get out. We reached my village by midnight. The dog smelled us and barked, but, recognising me, stopped talking. We climbed into the attic of the barn where our two cows stood and settled down on the hay. When the iron hook on the barn door rattled in the morning, we woke up and listened to every sound. My sister Natalia had come in. She and Nadia were twins. Since she was not able to study, Natalia had run away from Sofia and returned to the village. Now she helped my mother with the household chores and worked with her in the fields, very happy to be free from the harassment of the teachers. After milking the cows, she put the milk pots by the door and went up to the attic to throw some hay for the cattle. It was a critical moment. She could either be frightened and squeal with fear, or she could cry, as her eyes were always wet. Thanks to our caution, the former was avoided, but the latter happened. Oh, brother! She cried out with tears in her eyes and rushed to me. How did you dare to come? Don't you know that Nadia and Boyan have been arrested? I don't know anything. When did this happen? The day before yesterday. We got a telegram from Kolo. Koljo was my third brother working on a construction site in Sofia. It was clear that the police were looking for me. That day, although I had the opportunity to see some of my family, the anxiety caused by the possibility of a police check dampened my joy. My mother and grandmother wore black scarves. That must have meant I was dead. Their mourning reinforced and strengthened the rumours that unknown people were spreading. It's a good thing, I said to mom and grandma. Let people think I'm not alive and don't give them any reason to think it's not true. It was clear to everyone what my mother might be interested in. Her questions revolved around one thing, how I lived, what I ate, where I slept, what they would do to me if they captured me. I reassured her, assured her that I had food and an apartment, that the party was taking care of me, that I would not fall into enemy hands alive, which in her mind meant that there would be a firefight and I might die in that firefight. My mother was a meek woman. Not once she did not quarrel with anyone. In this respect, she was the complete opposite of my father, who could not live a day without quarrels. Although my mother had only completed three grades of elementary school, she could read any handwriting and wrote letters to half the women on her street. We were eight children, five boys and three girls, and no one was sick with any more or less serious illnesses. Mom was just as strong and healthy. She ploughed by herself, reaped by herself, knitted sheaves by herself, spun a primitive windrower by herself, and carried firewood by herself. She was the man of the house. Our grandfather was also a good man. In spite of his almost eighty years, he too could not resist and came to see me. Leaning on a staff, he waddled to the barn, kissed me and said, You have chosen a good path, but a dangerous one. Beware, don't trust random people. Some people are mean, some are stupid. Oh, take care of yourself, Slavcho, take care of yourself, son. My grandmother and mother asked me in one voice. Those were their last words when we parted. And my grandfather, saying goodbye, called me affectionately Goose and later never called me by my name. I never saw my father again. I wanted to feel him through my mother and then decide whether to meet him. On the day of our meeting with Raiko Nikolov, I called my twelve-year-old brother Pesho, a bright and clever boy, for a confidential conversation. It turned out that gun fever had taken hold of him as well. I don't remember how, but he got himself a gun. A badanka cut off part of its barrel and hid it so that his elders wouldn't take it away. He also had a few cartridges. He could not resist temptation and showed us his combat kit. I said nothing of the sort, only advised him to be very careful when shooting and to carefully conceal from strangers that he had a gun. 
He could not have been more pleased than to receive my approval. He seemed to have grown wings, and the boy was ready to go into fire and water. The meeting with Raiko took place in the evening at a place called Blagoino Gumno. He came armed and in high spirits, under the influence of the progressive-minded pupils of our gymnasium and his father. A communist, Raiko accepted our ideas. But his friendship with the legionnaires in the town caused doubts as to the sincerity of his attitude to the party cause, and therefore Kevtkov and I set him the following task as a test. To set fire to a haystack of bread at the headman's house. Although a shadow of embarrassment appeared on his face, Raiko did not refuse. Hey, as long as you are with me, I am not afraid, he said, and was the first to go forward. We agreed that immediately after the action he should return to his home, and when the neighbours rushed to put out the fire, he should run with them. In this way, the slightest suspicion of his involvement in the arson would be eliminated. The sheaves were dry and burst into flames like gunpowder. The fire engulfed the whole haystack and immediately spread to the other buildings, the barn and the shed.